Good evening. The board is just reconvened out of closed session. We will move to 4.01. I will call for a motion to approve the February 5th, 2024 personnel report. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Ms. Escobar. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The personnel report is approved as presented. We'll move to 5.01 with our Pledge of Allegiance. If you will please stand. At this time, I'd like to ask that you please join me in a moment of silence for Diana Metzler, a longtime counselor at Mount Pleasant High School who passed away last week. We'll move to 6.01. Before we adopt the agenda, board members, the agenda item 9.01 summer 2024 retesting plan is not included on the agenda. I call for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Treadaway. Is there any discussion, board members? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda as presented say aye. aye. Opposed? The agenda is approved as presented. We will move to 7.01, board chair comments. The Cabarrus County Board of Education mission is to provide a world-class education to all 35,000 children in our district. With that mission comes a responsibility to empower and direct our district leaders to set up strategies and plans to keep our school system in line with the current and projected population growth in our county. This board approved the partnership with Cooperative Strategies to provide a data collection and much needed long range realignment plan in early 2023. The board has been immersed in this process over the past 12 months and given multiple opportunities to ask questions and get feedback. As a board, we are also responsible to direct our district leaders to create and work with our county commissioners for the funding of a long range master bill plan, which also has been completed. Our decisions both tonight and during our February 12, 2024 business session will affect not only our current student body, but the next generation of students that will attend Cabarrus County Schools. I challenge this board to look into the future and see the outcome that you wish to evolve from these plans that are set before you. And I'll leave you with this quote. If you always make the right decision, the safe decision, the one most people will make, you will be the same as everyone else. And that's from Paul Arden. We will move to 7.02 with our superintendent comments with Dr. John Kapicki. Thank you, Mrs. Adcock. Just want to update the board and the public on a few events that have taken place at some of our schools over the last couple of weeks. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the governor, Governor Cooper, for visiting C.C. Griffin um, within the last two weeks. At that particular event, he declared the year of public schools education tour. The governor, along with teachers, students, educational leaders, and local officials, celebrated the exemplary work at C.C. Griffin and emphasize the crucial role, crucial role of public education in strengthening North Carolina's communities. Governor Cooper reiterated his commitment to K-12 education and early childhood funding and advocated for increased teacher pay in the upcoming legislative session. He called for a halt in state spending on vouchers for unaccountable private schools until public schools are fully funded. He plans to spotlight North Carolina's strong public schools, teachers, and staff over the next year to demonstrate the positive impact of a well-funded public education system on the state's economy and communities. Public schools in Cabarrus County and across the state have excelled, continue to excel, in preparing our students for success into the future. Let us all join in recognizing the efforts to support and invest in public education, ensuring a brighter future for North Carolina. 
on that note, congratulations to Weddington Elementary School for becoming a top magnet school in 2024. I'm thrilled to extend heartfelt congratulations to the outstanding staff and students at Weddington Hills Elementary School. Their dedication and excellence have earned them a prestigious accolade as one of the top 2024 magnet schools of excellence by Magnet Schools of America, the National Association for Magnet and Theme-Based Schools. At Weddington Hills Elementary, a commitment to excellence is woven into the fabric of each day. The students, staff, and administration immerse themselves in innovative inquiry-based learning, celebrate the richness of language and diversity, and actively engage in meaningful service to others. These remarkable initiatives have garnered Weddington Hills national recognition. This honor is a testament to the ongoing dedication of the Weddington Hills Elementary to provide a dynamic and enriching and educational environment. Let us applaud their achievements, celebrate the culture of excellence they have created, and one that thrives within the walls of Weddington Hills Elementary School. So congratulations to them. I'd also like to congratulate the Royal Oaks School of the Arts teacher, Kim Martin, who secured a grant to bring a life-changing project to fruition. On January 22, 2024, students at Rosa engaged in an incredible hands-on experience building functional 3D printed prosthetic hands for individuals in need around the world. Mrs. Martin, working with her students, first learned about the Hands of Gratitude during a meeting in August of 2023. She saw an opportunity to incorporate philanthropy, STEAM, character strengths from the Positivity Project, and AIG goals into a single project for her students. So I want to congratulate her for bringing that and a $2,000 grant from the Union Power Corporation to the Royal Oak School of the Arts and allowing our children to participate in that wonderful opportunity. So congratulations to her and all of Rosa's faculty. I'd also like to uh, restate something that I have stated several times. Um, once I, I know it's been printed in the paper. I've stated it once before publicly, and I want to say it again to be very clear about this. If our board should propose a, if, if our board should pass a recommended realignment plan in the coming weeks, and it impacts the Beverly Hills, Coltrane, Webb Elementary Schools. And if, the, if, if a vote goes through tonight to close Beverly Hills, I want to be very clear about this. Any child impacted by a Beverly Hills closure will have the opportunity to, to come back to the school that is built on Coltrane Webb's elementary school site. Um, I, I, I guarantee that any child that wants to come back to Coltrane Webb Elementary School will have that opportunity. So I want to say that publicly um, and so that everyone understands that it has been stated several times now and it, it, that question has been asked of me repeatedly, so I want to make sure that I clear that up with everyone. Third quarter progress reports went out this week on February 5th, so I'll ask all parents who check the portal for that and make sure they look at that so they can get the updated information on the progress of their students. We have an early dismissal this Friday, February 9th. Please check the appropriate tiers that your child in, is in. The high schools dismiss at 11 o'clock, the elementary schools at 12 o'clock, and the middle schools at 1 p.m. And then lastly, it is the Black History Month. February is always the Black History Month for all schools. We will have some more updates on that next week and celebrating the Black History Month in Cabarrus County Schools. Thank you, Ms. Zekka. And as I'm gently reminded, it is also School Counselors Week. <laughs> and I want to thank all of our counselors truly and sincerely for all the work that they do. We talk an awful lot about mental health and making sure that we address the social and emotional needs of our children. Um, our Student Services Department under the leadership of Amy Lauder, John Basilis, and Amy Jewell do a fantastic job working with the psychologists, the counselors, and the social workers to make sure that our students are well taken care of in the schools and those needs are met. Um, so I deeply appreciate, our board deeply appreciates, our community deeply appreciates all the work that they all do with our students on a daily day, on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we congratulate them, we applaud them, and we will celebrate them as a school counselors week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kopecki. We'll move to 7.03 with our attorney comments. Is there anything to share? Not this week, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Middle Brooks. We'll move to 8.01, our realignment review with Dr. Jonathan Bowers. Welcome, Dr. Bowers. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to you, members of the board, and Dr. Kapicki. 
Um, it's my pleasure to come before you tonight to be able to give you a bit of a summary of what has transpired uh, over the last nearly year uh, that we've been part of the realignment effort that's taking place with Cabarrus County Schools. Um, tonight what you'll see is a bit of a uh, summation on some of the information that's been presented uh, and also gives you a, a sense of what have been the key milestones that have taken place up to this point and also an opportunity to be able to address some of the questions which we have fielded uh, from the public. Uh, some things that we found have been uh, some frequent questions and things that we want to make sure that we are certainly attentive to and we provide an answer to so that individuals have the best information they can to move forward uh, with the next step in the process. So if you really think about the outline tonight, there are several things we want to be able to cover. Uh, again, review those milestones, but also to review the key, tri key criteria excuse me, that have been part of the framework for the realignment along the way. What were some of those key tenets, some of those drivers uh, that, that played a key role in the development of the boundary process, and also the recommendation that came from cooperative strategies. I want to review certainly there with the utilization, the feeder patterns, diversity, and our proximity. One of them focused a little bit on transition plans. A lot of questions about if, when and a boundary proposal were to be adopted, what would be the next step? What would that look like? So again, to be able to highlight some of those key activities so that individuals have a sense of what takes place. And then also understand and recognizing the importance of the Long Range Facilities Master Plan. Because again, as, as has been illustrated and certainly stated throughout this process, is that this, this is in tandem with the Long Range Facilities Master Plan, the realignment effort. One does not happen without the other, and if so, if it were to, it certainly uh, could disrupt uh, the other uh, plan itself. So it's, it's important to keep both of these in mind as we certainly sequence through this and as we think what the next step will be. So we'll start with the milestones. Oh, excuse me, you've seen this graphic before. This is just a reminder exactly what were those key dates, where have we come from, when did this begin? So the kickoff was March of last year. And then you can see some of the sequencing events throughout the cooperative has touched upon and has brought us up to this point tonight. This here's process overview. And again, when we say process, it's important to revisit that to say that there was a, an intentional process, there was a, uh, an elaborate process, and there was a well-defined process that really drove us to where we are. Uh, it began with the, the kickoff itself and the establishment of some feedback groups. We had community focus groups. We had community meetings. There was an internal redistricting committee. We had an opportunity with the CCS Engage page to collect feedback from our general public and our stakeholders. So again, understanding that this was a cumulative uh, uh, timeline that took effect. And then throughout that, there was a review period. Everything that was collected was reviewed and had an ample opportunity for individuals to be able to weigh in on that and certainly voice uh, and share uh, their thoughts and opinions on that. Uh, and then once the feedback then was, was collected, then ultimately that resulted in the presentation of a scenario or recommendation before the board and the superintendent himself. So again, as we mentioned, the key criteria, always being able to look back through the lens of what were those elements that were certainly at the heart of the recommendations. And so when we think about this through the lens of utilization, Obviously, it's ensuring that we uh, are doing um, as best we can to ensure that the space, the capacity we have available, uh, we're using it to be able to serve the students that are enrolled in Cabarrus County Schools. When we think about the school level feeder patterns, that's that continuity, that's that stability. As a child progresses from elementary to middle to high, being able to be with his and her peers and their cohort of peers uh, throughout those transitional grades such that that builds in uh, a sense of belonging, relationships, and certainly emphasizes that. When we look at the proximity, obviously looking at this through the lens of when assignments are made, uh, what does that do in terms of where an individual may reside, uh, and how does that then impact their, their, the distance from the school uh, or the, the closest school to which they would be assigned. And then ultimately diversity as well. We want to make sure that our schools are as representative of the makeup of Cabarrus County Schools as best as possible. So again, all of these factors in, in, in tandem were certainly at the heart of the recommendation proposal that you have before you. So we'll take a peek at utilization. So here are some of the questions we fielded when it, as it pertains to utilization and some of the most commonly um, asked uh, uh, sort of inquiries from the public. Uh, first of all, how are the boundary lines drawn? And so when we think about this, boundary lines themselves, it's an inexact science, I should say that. All right, so one of the things that we have to go to is that what are some of the existing features that we already have that might give us a sense of what might serve as sort of the area or the periphery of an attendance boundary. Geographical locations certainly are one that are commonly used. Rivers, creeks, streams, areas that are a little bit more difficult to pass and navigate through from a transportation standpoint. 
We also have things such as man-made objects as well. You think about divided highways. A divided highway is difficult to navigate across because in many cases you may have one directional turns and therefore it creates a little bit of a, a challenge uh, to be able to have students on one side of the road transported to the other even though line of sight may be a very well be short for them or very uh, close proximity, uh, getting there sometimes looks a little bit different when you travel the road network itself. Uh, minimize dividing neighborhoods is obviously another uh, important aspect of this. Want to ensure that when we look at this across the board, that, that neighborhoods aren't split because then that goes back to basically breaking up the feeder pattern. And now all of a sudden, students who certainly reside or live in the same neighborhoods don't have the opportunity to be able to get or continue those relationships and let them play out of school. And then obviously we want to make sure that we're accounting for future development and future growth. So being able to position ourselves such that when a boundary line is drawn, uh, there is an element of what sort of projects, what sort of developments, what are some of these key projects that are going to take place over time. Uh, and knowing what that potential student yield might look like helps us when we actually look at utilization and being able to make those determinations. Next question there is why can't the closest school um, always be assigned? Uh, I think we've seen that play out. I, I think that was called uh, option B or scenario B. And so w with that is when you go with the school that might be closest to your home, it will create some challenges. And what we'll do is we'll find extreme overutilization in some place and extreme underutilization in other areas. So again, that's another element that is sometimes used. Uh, and we know that's sometimes challenging for individuals to understand but it does allow us to be able to ensure that from an efficiency standpoint and from a student service standpoint, uh, we are making use of every available seat that we have across the district. And you see down at the bottom is that it is important to remember that any changes with these, one tweak, one adjustment, can disrupt the feeder pattern, can disrupt the utilization, can disrupt diversity, and can disrupt where we are from a planning standpoint moving forward. So it, it could impact each of our key criteria along the way. This is just a summary, you've seen this before, but this again behind where we are and some of the efforts that went into why decisions may have been made. Our enrollment pressure right now from a capacity standpoint is concentrated in the northwestern part of the county, southwestern part of the county, and even some elements now are seeping into the central part of the county as well. So understanding and positioning ourselves with a boundary option that allows for that was certainly one of the operating factors here. And so some, the proposal uh, certainly it is before us now takes that into consideration. Um, we do anticipate additional sewer capacity opening in the not too distant future. And then when it does, we just, we understand and we believe that that is going to foster and continue to fuel the growth that is currently, uh, that is happening as we speak. So again, knowing that and anticipating that helps us be out in front of it rather than being reactive. This is an opportunity to be proactive to that. And you can see there, wow, we're expected to reach 40,000 students by the end of this decade. So just to think some of those growth graphics you've seen uh, along the way, we've grown by 17%, uh, increase in 17% in terms of our student enrollment over the past 10 years, and we anticipate that same projection playing out for the next 10 years. So when we look at the utilization, ultimately, scenario C revised, what it, what it is able to accomplish, we can see that for elementary, middle, in high schools. We are reducing the number of schools that are less than 80% utilized. We are increasing the number of schools that are between 80% and 100% utilized. And we're reducing the number of schools that are over 100% utilized. Now we haven't eliminated those just yet, but this is an effort to get closer. Then when combined with the facilities master plan, gives us the chance to free ourselves from that over 100% utilization with additional capacity being on, bro on board in the future. So once again, when we talk about this being uh, somewhat married to the facilities master plan, that's where we would anticipate seeing that play out. So again, the goal is to better utilize underutilized schools, reduce some of the overutilization, and get more of our schools within that 80% to 100% sweet spot or threshold. Feeder patterns, I think we've talked about that and certainly that's been part of the conversation as well. So one of the things that folks have wanted to know, how are the feeder patterns impacted by this? When we speak of feeder patterns, what, what does it do? What do we gain? Well, scenario C, greatly, uh, scenario C revised greatly improves our feeder patterns. Currently right now we have six elementary schools of which 100% of the students feed directly into the next middle school in sequence. So when you think about our elementary schools, we have 20. So six out of 20, we have 100% of kids that progress to the next middle school as a cohort. 
Under this particular scenario, scenario C revised, that number would increase to nine. For our middle schools, we currently have two middle schools of which 100% of students progress to the next high school in sequence. And currently, we have nine middle schools in Cabarrus County Schools. Under scenario C revised, that number would go from two middle schools to seven middle schools. So again, significant increase on that front as well. Uh, so we do see with a feeder pattern uh, in terms of what this looks like moving forward, we see improvements across both elementary and middle uh, in terms of how students would matriculate to the grade levels together. And this just gives you a graphic image right here in itself in terms of where students under the current proposal, uh, where they're grouped together, where they would go, and then what percentages remain at other schools in terms of how they are split. And it's important to note, while we also talk about ideal state is to obviously have as many students as possible uh, certainly progress together, uh, this particular proposal, Scenario C revised, it also cleans up when schools were to have two to three school, or excuse me, three or four schools to which they were dividing student amongst. This one now reduces that significantly as well. And so we'll also see that it minimizes some of those so outliers to where you would have 6% of students or 10% of students just going to a school. We're able to now, with this particular scenario, uh, create a larger group of students that move together. When we look at the proximity, first question we usually get with that one is, why would I be sent to a school that is farther from where I live? And again, on the surface, we understand why we get that question a lot. But when we look at this from a district-wide realignment, and we think of this from a standpoint of the key criteria, from a utilization standpoint, sometimes a student may be boundary to another school because it allows for us to have better utilization at that particular school. It also contributes to that feeder pattern we just discussed and went through as well. So there are sometimes there will be inherent advantages there. And then again, many of our families right now who are sometimes moved to a particular area for a particular school, one of the beauties of Cabarrus County Schools is they have brought a, a, a sense of diversity to us and they have helped us grow and expand. Uh, one of the challenges that sometimes that presents too is these neighborhoods are growing neighborhoods and they're continuing to build out and they have more construction and more development taking place. And so some of the schools in which they are maybe closer to, those are some of our schools that are experiencing some of this growth and some of this overutilization and some of these pressures. So to be able to now be, say, before that development really comes in and before that community is fully built out, being able to say, hey, is there an opportunity for us to have students serve maybe at a school that might be somewhat farther away, but yet also give us greater utilization at that school, improve the diversity of that school, and also establish cleaner feeder patterns with that school. So sometimes that's why that happens for individuals. Another question we get is, how can we transport students to a school farther away when we have transportation challenges? Uh, first thing I would offer is that many of our transportation challenges are not because of the, the travel distance or it's not because of the, the boundary per se, it's, it's more about shortages, it's driver shortages. And, and being able to certainly fulfill, overcome that challenge would help us tremendously. But our transportation team has been a part of this process from day one and since its inception. They've had a chance to review, weigh in on, and even offer feedbacks throughout the process as proposals were being developed, as some of these um, ideas were certainly being shared with our feedback group. And our transportation team has weighed in and, and they have been very vocal about saying there is nothing about Scenario C revised that gives them any challenges from a boundary standpoint or from a travel standpoint. Again, they will say the same, and I don't mean to speak for them, they would say, the driver shortage is probably the greatest challenge they face right now. When we look at proximity across the board in terms of the percent of students that are attending the school closest to their home, one of the things that you see with Scenario C revised, it improves the number of students at every level across the district that would attend a school closer to their home. So from this standpoint, again, we can see that this plays out across all levels. Alongside that, and I don't have a graphic here to share with you, but we also know that Scenario C revised reduces the average distance traveled for students in elementary school, middle school, and high school across the district. So again, when we talk about more students will attend schools closer to their home, and more students on average will have less distance to travel, it does deliver on those two, uh, two fronts. And again, 
here you go. I'm sorry, this graphic is in here. So you can see those changes there as well. The mileage change and some of the differences between them. And you can see once again, it was reduced uh, across the board for all three levels. When we look at our diversity, and again, this is an important element for us as well, because we want to make sure our schools are certainly rich, thriving educational environments. And we know that diversity, diversity plays a key role in that. And so here, what we can see with Scenario C revised is what it does across the board from average household income to language other than English spoken at home to educational attainment. It has, on average, more schools moving closer to the district average, and that's what we want to see. Are there still schools that would be farther away and schools that still have not made that movement? The answer is yes. But again, as we look at this and as we think about it from a district as a whole and have we positioned ourselves or has this positioned ourselves to be closer to the district average for all of our schools, uh, the answer is yes on all three of these tenants. And then transition plans. This is the one where we probably have the most questions from individuals involved and say, okay, well, what next? What can I expect? What is taking place? How will this be shared with me? How will this be communicated? Um, so transition plans for Sam families and staff. Number one, a district ladder, I think. That's the one thing we're going to do. We're going to communicate with families who are impacted by a student assignment. Um, as a matter of fact, this was a healthy topic of conversation in cabinet this morning, and Dr. Kapicki uh, himself actually led uh, members of cabinet through the conversation to say, all right, let's begin thinking about what, we, what would our families want to hear? What do we need to be putting in place? And so a lot of these ideas really have come through those conversations to say actively we want to ensure that we are being good stewards of communication for them and we're reaching out and making sure that they feel welcome and they feel assured with whatever may take place in the future. The names of students. Schools will have the names of students provided to them. So then they themselves can begin uh, reaching out individually and developing their own welcome messages to schools. Whether that be through a newsletter, whether that be through a video message, whether that be through a personal outreach of some other sort. Schools will be positioned to be able to have that information and will know these individuals. We'll also have a projected timeline that schools will be expected to follow such that we can see systematically across the board. All schools are making the same overtures to students because again, with any change, we know there's always questions and always uncertainty, but our schools are truly positioned to be able to help certainly assuage any fears, make individuals feel better, and certainly reach out to them to, to share the wonderful things they offer and how great of an experience it's gonna be for students moving forward. And then our human resources team will be working with schools because there are going to be questions with staff, certainly for schools that are either gaining or losing enrollment, that could certainly have an impact. Um, in most cases, you would find as a principal, I always found that trish, attrition handled most of my challenges sorry, when it came to staffing, and folks would basically just slide into positions already created. But if we recognize that there are some, some outliers to this, and certainly there needs to be some consideration, um, our human resources team is, is certainly a, is adept and, is, and is, is on top of this and has been involved and can anticipate where that might be in assuring individuals that they will have employment for the upcoming school year. How are schools preparing for capacity changes? Again, we've given schools everything we can from what they can expect to gain or lose based off of scenario C. So the same resources to which we have certainly shared with the board and provided to the board, we've equipped our schools with that same information as well. We've also been able to meet frequently with principals through the PK-12 meetings. Uh, each month that we have had a <clears throat> PK-12 meeting since last March, there has been a topic on that particular agenda that pertains to realignment. So the conversation has been frequent, it's been ongoing. In each step along the way, they've certainly been brought up to speed with where we are as a district. And principals have been truly, um, um, I think it's been beneficial for us to hear from them. They have a voice and we want to make sure that we're certainly uh, attending to and, and sensitive to what's taking place at the school level. So they've helped us with some of these questions as well. And we've been able to stay out front and been able to say, hey, these are things we might not have thought about. So for our principals, they've been a key component of the planning process. And quite honestly, they were helpful with the focus groups as well because we had a wide representation from our principal groups. And then again, our human resources, as I mentioned before, is constantly reviewing Scenario C revised and is in a position to be able to support schools as needed with any staffing plans. Have teachers and staff been informed? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Again, when we go back to principals, one of the key takeaways from those principals meetings is they become the conduit, they become the, 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 the spokesperson, if you will, in their schools with what is shared. So they lead that conversation. 
We've also been able to use our Engage with CCS website. It has been a tremendous, tremendous benefit to have that, to be able to direct individuals to, but to also house resources and to also keep videos and to be able to archive information and also have questions presented there to which we can actually re interact with individuals in a two-way or dialogical format there. So again, that has served us tremendously. Uh, when we think about this from a staff point uh, or staffing point uh, from, from communication timeline, we'll be in a position to be able to make sure we message out to individuals to say, okay, here's what you can expect moving forward, whether that be for a, um, a, a student uh, realignment effort or whether that be for someone who is looking for a transfer as a teacher to go work in a different environment. Again, our HR team has certainly got those questions covered. Will program choice schools change? We hear that one a lot. And our program choice schools will not change. But what we might offer is that a student's pathway may change. So with our student pro program choice offering, students are assigned a particular pathway based on where they reside or based on where their, their home school may be. So if the home school were to change, they could end up changing a different school for program choice, but they would still have access to that program, albeit it may be at a different school. And again, we've accounted for that, and we're certainly reviewing that uh, once uh, we get all of our you know, applications in and once we start to process those and once the lottery itself take, plays out. Will students other than seniors be granted legacy status? Um, our recommendation is to grant legacy status to seniors only. Um, and we know that uh, there have been plans before where that might have been extended or certainly honored or offered to others, uh, but the rationale here is with a district-wide realignment, uh, this obviously has implications uh, when there are uh, additional allowances made for students to remain in their current setting uh, due to conditional factors. What it does is it certainly it ch creates challenges uh, with pinch points, because when we go back and we say, what does that do to utilization? What does it do then again to diversity? What does it do to a feeder pattern? Uh, and certainly what can it end up doing from a proximity standpoint? Uh, we can see that play out in a lot of different ways. Uh, so as it's extended to more students, uh, it just has the, 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 the potential to be able to disrupt uh, the realignment effort itself. Uh, and certainly it just it minimizes exactly the impact one would be able to get from it. The last piece here is our facilities master plan, right, moving forward, and certainly this piece. So a lot of questions surrounding that, future school construction and what this might look like down the road. So um, Hickory Ridge and Cox Mill have overcapacity schools. Does Scenario C revise avoid capping? Again, what Scenario C revised allows for is that when combined with the Long Range Facilities Master Plan, it allows for additional relief and capacity um, to be added to the northwest areas and the southwest areas of, uh, of the county. Uh, you can see here, and I'll mention this in a moment, about some future schools and their placements, but building that capacity in with future school construction, that will give us an opportunity to have relief. All right, so it's, we can't say that this, the realignment will avoid any sort of decisions regarding capping down the road, we can say realignment with facilities master plan will certainly get us in a place we have additional capacity and that is less likely to be an option, all right, that would have to be explored. Location of future schools has come up and where those might be. So again, we do know for a fact that we have a uh, replacement option for uh, Beverly Hills and Coltrane Webb, which was discussed and that has been presented to the before the board. Um, we've looked at uh, the Northwest Cabarrus High School. We've identified the land, the property. That is, the design is more or less built out. It's just a matter of moving forward with funding for that particular project. Southwest Elementary School, we do have property in hand for that. So that is something to which we actually uh, have uh, a site uh, to which we could begin development on. Again, once a funding stream and a funding source is identified and we're actively still seeking land for Northwest Elementary School where that might be. So again, those are the focal points at this point. Those are the priority areas at this point. It's not to say that those will be our only areas, but as we look at this in terms of what a short-term timeline might be over the next two years, those are some of the key areas to which we have certainly identified and we've placed a priority on. Uh, the question about delaying has come up. Um, some to a later date, 2026. Um, and, and you know, one of the challenges with that would be, first of all, any decision to delay, it, Boards can't bind future boards to their decisions. That's one of the things that certainly we understand and we respect. Uh, so uh, a decision made by this board on any front would certainly not be one that two years from now a, a different board uh, would be in a position to honor. Right? So that's one of the things that we certainly have to recognize. Another thing too is that obviously there must be fiscal implications associated with a delay. 
fiscal op implications in terms of uh, operating certain facilities right now that have higher uh, uh, operational costs than what you would find across the district. And also, again, some of our schools that we do see some overutilization and some capacity issues with. So those would certainly be prevalent uh, with a delay in place. Um, any construction costs we have would certainly be escalated two years out with any delay. So <clears throat> one of the options we brought forth is obviously the um, Mary Frances Wall uh, redevelopment rebuild. In that particular project, when priced out or when quoted, we could expect to see some significant increase with that if there would be a two-year delay to that particular project. Same with any elementary school construction uh, should that be uh, taking place in the uh, foreseeable future. And then obviously we've got additional boundary work. The boundaries as we know them today would not necessarily be the boundaries that we say two years from now would be what's needed. Um, obviously with growth, obviously with student shifts, obviously with movement, um, it would be difficult to use data from two years prior to an effort to drive a future effort. And so that would obviously put us back in the position to where any delay, we would more than likely be starting over with the review the process, the feedback, much as we've done this past year. Um, again, so that would certainly be another factor to take into consideration. Another question we've got, why can't we just adjust the current proposal for Beverly Hills? Obviously, there have been several proposals from uh, that, that uh, I think some, some ideas, some offerings, some suggestions from the community. Um, uh, certainly, uh, folks have been creative uh, with what they've been able to offer and certainly been able to share. And, and, and their efforts, we, we appreciate that because we take those back, we review those, we look through those. We say, okay, is there something here that might have been missed or overlooked? Um, and you know, different perspectives will certainly emerge and people will have those. Um, but within the reviews that we have found, there's not a proposal that we have seen that certainly provides for us what would be the number of seats that would be needed uh, for the Coltrane Web, Beverly Hills community combined at a cost which we know could be certainly um, provided um, and also takes into account and consideration all the factors that would be associated with the, the pr proposal itself. Uh, so again, it's, we're always appreciating to look at those, but to just adjust the current proposal at this point for, for that community, uh, one of the things that has an opportunity to do, it disrupts the feeder patterns. Um, any shift of movement of students around those areas it obviously impacts more than just a particular school. It starts to impact the schools in the surrounding areas that obviously uh, are a part of Scenario C revised. Uh, we think about Arbor McAllister, we think about W.M. Irvin, we think about Rosa, we think about Weinkoff, we think about Weddington Hills, we think about Wolf Meadow. There's a segment of Rocky River Elementary School in there. These would all have impacts with that single decision alone in terms of moving students in different areas. And so that would certainly play out and we would see this in each of those key criteria as well. Um, and then again, the other thing to come back to is the process. Um, the process itself has been framed and it's been one in which there has been along the way a, a chance for engagement, feedback, exchange, revision, review. Um, and to adopt something now does not honor that process. Um, our focus groups, our internal redistricting committee, um, the community meetings even themselves, um, they were all an intentional part of what took place up to this point. And, um, you know, an adjustment made on this portion certainly uh, doesn't take that into consideration. So that would be yet another challenge that would be introduced. Will Beverly Hills Elementary students be able to attend the new replacement school? The answer is yes. And I think Dr. Kapicki led with that earlier. Students at Beverly Hills will have the opportunity to attend the replacement school. And so that's just, that's as plain as we can say that. Did the focus groups have representation from the downtown Concord area? We had that question. The answer was yes, they did. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had parents, we had community representatives, we even had a principal who is a oversee or serves one of the uh, schools in the downtown Concord area be a part of the focus groups. Um, and this one comes up a lot. Why can't we build two 500 seat elementary schools? Um, and again, I know that individuals are certainly looking through this through a creative lens and we respect that. Um, but number one, the enrollment projections for the areas combined do not support that. There is no number to which we say that there's enough to be able to support two 500 seat, two 450 seat, uh, two 400 seat elementary schools in this particular area. And that's why the recommendation that has been proposed thus far for a replacement option looks at 750 seats as an option there 
simply because those 750 seats would be allowable and would take in consideration the future growth that we see 10 years out with these two areas combined. The maintenance operational cost. Um, it just once again, the things that certainly would uh, be the challenge there is anytime you have two of something, there's twice the effort to maintain it. Uh, again, over time, that's two HVA systems. Two over time, that's two electrical systems. Over time, that's two plumbing systems. Over time, that's two uh, facilities themselves, the brick and mortar aspect, which certainly two roofs. So again, these just double those costs there in the long run. The staffing costs, obviously. Uh, we recognize that you know, it's, sometimes you can split things nice and evenly, and it works for teachers. If you have you know, 900 kids and you split them you know, into two schools with 450, you just split the teachers up. But one of the things that sometimes buildings don't take into consideration when you adopt that model is uh, the SROs that would be needed, the nurses that would be needed. When you look at this from a step, the office staff that would be needed. When you think about your counseling staff, when you think about your support services that would be needed in place. Again, doubling some personnel costs that would be associated with that. So um, ultimately, these are the challenges it presents. Um, and then the cost, again, we know others will, you, you can always get a cost which you can use but we've not seen any cost to which we can say building two 500 seat elementary schools is going to be any more practical, reasonable, or cheaper than one 750 seat elementary school. This here, just a reminder, these were some of the projects that were queued up from Cooperative Strategies as we went through the realignment study and as we went through the facilities master plan that they identified as being those key needs throughout. And again, I don't want to certainly overlook or downplay the piece to this that says deferred maintenance. One of the things that is obviously a part of this facilities master plan when we speak of it in our capital improvement plan, there is a deferred maintenance component that is attached to this. And that deferred maintenance component calls for a recurring debt set of dollars to be able to commit it towards our, our needs in each of our schools across the district. Again, when we say comprehensive, when we say over a, a truly district plan, this is that. So even schools not impacted by being reboundaried, even schools that are not even in the conversation about uh, any sort of student movement, there's an opportunity here with these plans combined for them to have needs addressed within their building that take care of some of that deferred maintenance and bring those schools up I don't, to what we know can be those first class facilities that they are. And so this addresses that and this allows for that. And so again, this is a touching every facet in every corner of our county. And there you can see, again, I've just included just for your review, what would those projects be and how would they play out over time and what would they certainly be sequenced as? Um, and again, the fluidity with this is just that. It allows for us to be able to annually to review, to be able to identify projects and to see where we are in our current, uh, sort of current state so that we can always prepare, adjust, and plan for where we need to move forward. Um, so again, the projects that we have, and these are projected costs associated with those. We've got these sequenced out, and this again, we would always look at what is our, our long-term vision for what would be um, sort of facility enhancement, facility improvement across Cabarrus County Schools. So I know that was a lot, uh, and, and, I, and I'm gonna pause there, because I know you have questions. So um, I will uh, certainly entertain any you might have. Is there any discussion, board members? Yes. Uh, Ms. Lindsay. Thank you for your presentation. Um, if you don't mind going back to, this has been one of the concerns that I've had regarding um, what we've been doing, and, and, and it wasn't learned until later in this process that we were not going to grandfather in fifth grade and eighth grade students. Um, my question is, that is one year worth of children who would be going into fifth grade and going into eighth grade if we voted on the plan C. Is that truly going to mess up everything that we've done to just allow those kids for one year that would be going into fifth grade and going into eighth grade to maintain and be grandfathered into those schools. I understand that mm -hmm. it may not push everything through as fast as everybody wants it to go, but truly in the grand scheme of all of this, is that one year of allowing those kids to be grandfathered in gonna mess up this entire realignment process? So the best way I can answer that is this. In the past, when you've realigned, you've only realigned 
a school or two at a time. So you have it, you've, to my knowledge, you've never realigned the entire district. To delay it, I believe when we do our numbers, it impacts over 800 students. 976 total students, so about a quarter of what we're expecting to do so, across okay. the district. So 976 students, it impacts what the, the, the transportation cost alone on that would be immense. So I understand what the policy says, but the policy also says, it says may, it doesn't say you have to. So that's why our recommendation is the seniors, which I believe is 128 last I looked, Dr. Bowers? Uh, yes, sir. We've got 126 seniors, yes. Okay. So 126 seniors is a lot easier to manage, right? The other thing, too, if you grandfather it, you know, brothers and sisters and siblings and things of that nature to kind of consider as well. So there's a lot of moving parts here, which is why our recommendation is because it's the first time we've done a district-wide realignment that when we implement it, we just grandfather in the seniors only. Okay. My other thing, um, you know, as far as when we've been uh, discussing this, is I asked for, and I just want this to be known out loud, um, for an option D, which I didn't call it an option D, but um, to see what this plan would look like by keeping Beverly Hills open. And just out of transparency was told that we cannot get a plan D until we vote on whether or not we are going to accept the plan that has already been um, presented to us, which is why we will not be getting presented with a plan D of what it would look like to have Beverly Hills kept open moving forward with this until we vote on the current plan that has been set forth. So that was what I wanted to, to make clear to everyone. And that's accurate. Our, our stance was we, we've given the recommendation and we believe this is the best recommendation for the Cabarrus County school system. And we are asking the board to act on that recommendation, either vote it or either approve it or not. And that'll give us direction moving forward. But you're accurate. Thank you. Ms. Escobar. Thank you. Uh, that was a lot of questions that I think we got a lot of information tonight that maybe we haven't heard before. So I appreciate the, the attention to the community. Um, going back to the transition plan, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of kids that are gonna be affected, especially if, if we don't let kids stay in their schools that one extra year. Um, how, thinking about Title I, what kind of tracking do we do with these kids? Meaning, uh, because there's federal dollars, there's counselors, there's all these, you know, this is a population of students that, uh, that I know accountability wise, the principals have to report on a regular basis. So I just, I just wanna have a good sense of how well can we track these kids and how can we have a pulse on the ones that are, that are being um, impacted by this. So, I mean, that's, to be frank, that's very easy to track. I mean, Dr. Roth and her team track that constantly and consistently. Um, we know who our Title I schools are. We know the, the allocations from the money we receive from the federal government, how we allocate that. We know what our free and reduced uh, percentages are. We know who our community eligible programs are. Um, we have that data. We know how to, we, we do track that consistently and constantly, and, and they, um, they will we will continue to do what we're doing um, before and after realignment, whatever decisions made, that's not, that will not change our process as to what we do. That okay. won't, it won't, it won't, it won't, imp, it won't impact us as to how we using the word track. I would say the way that we um, collaborate with those schools and how we fund those schools with the money that we're giving federal governments, it, it, the funding may change a little bit because the numbers change every year. It's a year to year thing. When you get the funding, you break down your percentages, you look at what your threshold is going to be, um, and then, then you go from there. So, I mean, some of those, mi some minor adjustments may be, need to be made, but nothing will be um, catastrophic or, or enormous. There won't be much change, okay? And if I'm saying that, but that answers the question? It, it does. I just, I guess I, I'm, I'm expressing a desire mm -hmm. uh, from the board to, to be able to, that this doesn't end with these votes on February today and February 12th, meaning that I, I want to have a good sense of what's happening with our, our students because, 
it's impacting so many students. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to see that these, I know that our, our people are committed yep. to, to making these transitions go well, but I want the people in the public to know that we're committed to making sure it goes well um, because um, our students are the most important part of this process. And so I know we talk a lot about money, I know we're talking about buildings yeah. and cost effects, what's effective, but my concern is the quality of the education that these kids are having. And if they're going to be impacted because they're being transitioned, um, I, want, I, I want to say that I want to, I want to regular updates on, on how they're doing. And, and there's restrictions. There was restrictions about tracking specific yeah. kids prior mm -hmm. to and all that kind of stuff. But once it's done, we know who they are. You're, we're, this principals are going to get names. I don't necessarily want names, but I want to know how they're doing. Yeah, and I think that we, we consistently develop, do that now. What I would say to you, and I know you're not saying this, and I know you, I'm going to say something I believe all the board believes. All of our schools in Cabarrus County are good. Whether you're a Title I school or not, all of our schools are good. And they're good because we have phenomenal teachers. And that, that, that's, the, that's the fact. Um, and we all know that. So whether you're a Title I school or not, you're going to receive the same. You're going to receive the same education with the same supports and the same resources that we need to help that child. So I, I can assure you of that. And I mean, Dr. Roth, am I missing anything that, that you would add to that? course will be in stages you know, based on the decisions made but we already have the, that in the works as to what we'll do as, as we move forward right and then speaking to that the staff um, I appreciated the, the including them in this transition and also understanding or having a better understanding that um, that for months our principals have been aware of what's been going on and seeing the maps and understanding the impact of what's coming to their school. I mean, I understand that nothing's final until these votes go through, sure. but understanding that um, staff will have to absorb whatever decision that we make. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that they are, that they have a, a voice in this process mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then, and I, I'll just, I'll just go, I understand the reason for the legacy issue. Um, but I, I do say that for, I just think not being able to finish fifth grade at your schools is, is, is hard. I mean, elementary school, six years. Um, that's longer than, I mean, I'm stating obvious things, but I, I don't love that idea. Um, and I also think juniors and seniors, um, junior year, same thing, like at a high school level. Um, that's, you know, you're, you're planning, to, in your junior year, you're already thinking about possibility your path your career path or your college path mm -hmm. um, and so I don't love it but I understand why it exists yeah. so I just appreciate the explanation um, I will say that there I, I, I want to thank the public for reaching out to us um, all those emails um, from the Beverly Hills elementary community but I also just want to name some other communities that have reached out um, the farm uh, Wellington Chase Cannon Run Twin Creeks Magnolia Springs um, we've read your emails. We understand. We have specific information. So if, if we need more details about that, we can get that to you. Um, but I think this summarizes very well a lot of the questions that we've, we've received. So thank you. Ms. Sandage. Sure. So can you help me understand how you go and change a school from not STEM to STEM? How does that happen and what does that look like? Ooh, let me make it make sense. Yeah. So last week or week before last, I was told that Irvin is not currently a STEM school, but we're going to make it turn into one. So right. I want to know what that looks like. So that's the initiative of the principal. So in talking with Dr. Wells, he is preparing to um, set the building blocks in place to uh, create a STEM environment to create a STEM school at Urban. Um, so the process really ultimately, it, it, it revolves around professional development of student, or excuse me, professional development of teachers, um, working with the STEM coaches, making sure that you have the um, instructional supplies and, and things of that nature to do. Uh, but Dr. Wells has done this before at Beverly Hills. He's very well prepared to do it at Irving. And when we were kind of going through this, that was one of the things that people had asked us about. So we, we worked with Dr. Wells to make sure that he was willing to do that. And I can tell you, he's more than excited to bring STEM to Urban Elementary. 
So that'll be Irvin and Royal Oak should uh, we close Beverly Hills. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So when we talked about one of the program changes early on about how program choice would be impacted, obviously there would be an opportunity that if Irvin were to gain a STEM program, that for those schools that are currently being served by Beverly Hills, that that option would certainly be put into consideration as well. Okay. And then for the staff that would be transitioning based off of the closure of, of Beverly Hills, we're saying we don't know or we we don't know where they'll be going at this point. Is that what, do I understand that correctly? Or we do know if this happens, these staff are going here. Cause you said there were conversations with HR and I just don't know if those conversations mean we've identified these staff and we've identified where these staff are going. So what occurs are some of the conversations that we're having now um, to prepare for that. The bottom line is once the board makes the decision and that kicks in the process to start working with Dr. Williams and his team and they already have done some of the preliminary work um, just to be prepared. We don't want to be waiting until the last minute. But what happens is our allotment process uh, starts in early March. And then what we do is we sit down with all of our principals, look at their enrollment, look at how many kids are going to be there, what the requirements are in terms of teachers and sections, et cetera. We then lay that out with them. So when the board gives us direction as to what that looks like, meaning you vote the realignment process through, then we know what we need to do. And if you don't, then we also know that we have to set up a different direction. But we are well prepared and well versed in, in planning schools and doing a master schedule, if you will, of the district of assigning all of our teachers. There will be some transfer. There will be some transition. One of the early things that we'll look at is the transfer list to say, okay, who wants to transfer and how can we take a look at that and see where those teachers that want to transfer where, where they want to go and see how much that lessens the movements of teachers, okay, uh, involuntary, if you will. Um, once we're through that process, we go through the natural allotment process as we do every year, and then we will assign the teachers accordingly. But we will work with HR, we will work with Mr. Penn, um, and, and get that right. Okay. I think this is my last question. So one of the questions that I asked during our board two by twos was about uh, a hardship. And I don't know if my question was understood, but I still didn't. It wasn't clear for me what the process would be for students or families for Beverly Hills. So this is how I read it. And I just want you to you know, bring me to where you are. So if Beverly Hills closes, the board decides, decides to close Beverly Hills. I look at, and I asked a few weeks ago about students being able to complete an, a hardship. If whatever realignment plan goes with uh, option C for them, if that does not work for their situation, their family can complete a hardship and it can be considered. If a school is closed, if Beverly Hills is closed, I'm trying to understand how those parents fill out a hardship for a school that's closed. I don't understand that. Can you help me understand it? Yeah, so I'm looking at it right now to make sure they're a policy. So there, there is policy. The number escapes me right now. Do you remember offhand? 40, 4150, 3, I 4150. believe. 4150. 4150 outlines a hardship process. And for anyone that wants to engage in applying for hardship, all they have to do is go to policy 4150, follow that process, and then we will work through that system with them that was the answer i got and that's the answer i don't understand so i but i thank you so i guess what i'm saying is the policy outlines what qualifies as a hardship we don't automatically grant hardships there's got to be a reason and a rationale behind that and the policy kind of guides what what hardships what hardships would be accepted if a person applies for it so if anyone is thinking of that what i would say is to call the school first call the, the principal of the school and then we will work with them on making sure that they follow that process well. Um, that is uh, through student services offices, and we kind of work with them on a consistent basis on filling out hardships. So okay. it's something we're very familiar with doing and working with parents if they need that. Okay. I'm still not where y'all at, but okay. It would, I'll, I'll take be, it. I'll be very clear. It would be very it, – it, it, the, 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 300 hardships are not going to be handed out. I mean, that, that's not going to happen. There's a process and what qualifies for hardship and what doesn't. So I just want to be very clear about that. I hear you completely. I'm okay. still just Got not it. where you are. And okay. I probably won't be. Um, the other question that I asked was about, geez, I just lost it. Mm. Can you come back to me? Because mm -hmm. I just lost that. Oh, oh, nope. 
that's another question. But the other question was about, and it probably goes and piggybacks on um, Ms. Laura's response earlier. So I asked about like, what if Beverly Hills doesn't close? Cause we didn't get a plan that offers us the ability to see if Beverly Hills doesn't close. Like what's, what's next, what happens? I didn't get an answer for that either. Well, I think what happens there is what Dr. Bowers has just outlined for you, that we need to have a serious conversation about addressing some of the design safety features in that building that exist that are gonna be quite costly to fix. And the board will have to make those, those decisions as well. Um, because I've stated there are so many design safety issues in that building that, that they, they can't go unaddressed if we're gonna have students there. I think I got my question answered about EC. Um, but if it's not answered when we complete today, then I'll ask it again. Thank you. Mr. Floyd. Thank you. I've got a <clears throat> few questions. I'm just going to do two so I don't hog, hog your time and I can come back around if the others don't hit on mine. One is on slide 22, our transition plans. How the teachers and staff been informed. Bullet point says all staff will have a position for 2024-2025. A couple things on that. I'm, I guess, I mean, again, I understand teacher for teacher. What happens to the non-duplicated positions? Do we have a spot for them? And what if they all have a job? Well, they all want a job. There's some staff and teachers that are at a school because it's a specific school. And if something were to happen to that school, they might not be interested in having a job anymore as a teacher or as a staff member. And understanding we can't control that but have we considered that and are we prepared for that potential inevitability? I think it's a very good question. I think it's, I will say it's one that we've entertained as it's been brought to us. Um, I, you know, to your point, and you know, I can't predict what people may or may not do based on decisions we make. Um, but I would say to that end, one of our challenges is always recruiting and retaining. And to be frank, I mean, COVID has flipped the system on its head. What we're seeing now, we've never seen before. Um, so we, we're constantly adjusting and, and readjusting to make sure that we fill our schools. And it's challenging. And we're, we're not unique. We're like every school system in the country. And staffing is, is something that we continue to be, it continues to be problematic in our, in our, in our district. I don't believe teachers are going to wholesale leave. I just don't. I think we have too many dedicated employees here. Um, but I, I, you know, I can't speak for what people's intentions are. In terms of the non-duplicated, I'd ask Dr. Williams to please address that. And I, can, I mean, I've got a list of them I can give, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I do. Um, yeah, so what I would say is there's a natural attrition that occurs in all of those positions, those they're classified positions for the most part. Um, when And we have natural attrition that occurs. We do have a plan in place um, in terms of, of those folks to be able to make sure that they um, are able to transition to equal or equitable positions in the district, um, similar to what they have at their current location. So even if they're a, like a head custodian, now there's one less head custodian position. There are, but there are openings for head custodians. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think a major problem that the Beverly Hills community has with this with us in this situation is trust um you know they've been lied to before felt like they've been lied to especially they've been told what they wanted to hear that you know a lot of times we knew we can never deliver but we just wanted to hide from a problem so we told them what they wanted to hear and now here we are and the story has changed on them many times not just once or twice but this has kind of gone on for a long time i've been here a long time and i'm not I'm not a hundred but i'm 40. uh <laughs> 41, thank you. <laughs> so currently, and I'm, I'm in the streets, they've got a major doubt that they'll ever be brought back to this combined school's promise. If you hit on slide 26, that's where I'm concerned. First bullet point, future boards aren't bound on their decision of previous boards. So if they've got a major doubt, how can we help them assuage that doubt? How can we guarantee they come back? Is it possible to swing them together so that we have no choice but to keep them together? What are our options other than to say, trust me, we're not the same board as the last board? Uh, 
I think it's a very fair question. Um, and we were, when we were researching this, and, and if I'm wrong on any of this, correct me, because as you know, this is my third year here, and I'm doing the history and getting caught up. My understanding was back in 2018, Royal Oaks Elementary School was built to replace Beverly Hills. The students were supposed to be swung in there then. And that particular board, if I, if I understand the story correctly, did not uh, vote to put them there, and there was a lot of pushback on that. The county then never funded the, the, the issues at Beverly Hills or for whatever reason. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, but the, that funding never came through. There was, there was never a plan, to my knowledge, to do anything to Beverly Hills Elementary School. I'm not saying that was right. I'm just saying what, I, what, I, what I've looked at and, and the homework I've done, and then you look at the capital plan, there was never a plan that I'm aware of that Beverly Hills Elementary School was going to be replaced in 2026. That, I know that was said and stated. I've never been informed of that. So my look at it, and I can't get inside of people's heads, and I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, but I think that the county's looking at it like, well, we already gave you the replacement school, and you didn't take an opportunity to do that. And then the board voted to keep it. And then the board voted. I and the board voted to keep the school open. Again, I'm not pointing a finger, that's my understanding. So now here we sit today and you're asking me, well, how can you trust me? I think it's a fair question. And, and, and I understand people's consternation and, and worry. Um, I assure you, a superintendent, that they will have the opportunity to come back to that school. I'm saying that publicly, I've said it publicly several times. Dr. Bowers pointed out tonight, I pointed out tonight, I've reported that to the paper when they've asked me that, I've never backed off or wavered on that, that should the school close and we build a school to replace, we have to keep in mind too, Coltrane Web 2 is being closed, so you have two schools that were, were closing to, to combine the one because of the population with the data and the evidence state, and we have articulated clearly and repeatedly that those kids will have the chance to go back to that school. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. I understand that, that, that another board can come along and say that, but our job is to realign and assign kids to schools. So I don't see how a future board could stop that particular situation. I have a, a sub-question. I know I said two. This is two, two alpha. Um, and I don't mean to cut up to, to Mr. Floyd. Dr. Bauer said I didn't miss anything No, nope, that's there. fine. No, sir, and I think it is important to remember that any time a new school were open, there would be a boundary option on well, the table, too. And so, uh, that's a great point, because yeah. one of the things we said is in the future, the only realignment, according to this plan, that we see in the next 10 years is when we open new schools. So we would have to have realign to boundary, Coltrane right. Webb because it is a new school, and we stated at that, and our intention is if the Coltrane Webb kids come in there, the Beverly Hills Elementary School kids go in there as well. <clears throat> okay. Um, what if, and I know we've talked about this, but I'd like to elaborate and get some detail. What if I've got a first grader and I have a preschooler? Not, and, and, and my first grader is now grandfathered into this guarantee. What about my four year old that's going to be six in two years and going to first grade? Are we going to two different elementary schools? How can we guarantee that or not guarantee it? Our intention is not to separate siblings. That, that's not something that we would do at that point in time. So if you have siblings, we want them all to go to school together. So that would be, when we say together, they'll have a chance to go there. We're, 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 we're talking about brothers, sisters, siblings that are, that are not yet there, that could be there in two years. Okay. Mr. Walter. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I guess the first question again is why are we not recommending the rebuild of the school is it because of the size? Just so I'm clear, you uh, Beverly Hills. So recommending a rebuild? You're not recommending rebuilding a school with that site or that elementary school with that site? Because to rebuild back on site for the capacity that is needed for these two areas combined, we don't have any plan, any concept, any scenario that gives us a layout that allows us to be able to so, serve so the number of students. I, that I don't quite I don't quite understand that part because. I mean, Culture Co-op is a, a wonderful example of filling a school that normally wouldn't be filled. I mean, there's a bunch of folks that come to that school that are not in the district. Yes, sir, that's correct. So you would do the same thing for a replacement school. You'd find a program so that attracts I guess your question is, why not build two schools is what you're asking. No, I was just asking. We're just rebuild we're, Beverly Hills instead of Culture At this Web. point, that was the... 
So the recommendation at the moment is to, build, is to replace it with one school, and then you want to combine the two schools, but yet we're taking 100 kids from Weddington and putting it into, into that group. That would make it, I mean, is that, is that correct? I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Okay, I mean, again, I'm going back to where, where, where the recommendation is not to build an elementary school at that location. Yes, so when again, what I'll back up and what I'll offer is this, is that the realignment proposal is married to the Long Range Facilities right. Master Plan. So when you look at the recommendation that comes out of the Long Range Facilities Master Plan, the recommendation is not to build two small 400 to 450 seat elementary schools on the boundary of or on the site of Coltrane Webb and Beverly Hills. The recommendation is to build one combined school that would be able to capitalize upon lower construction cost and also reduce some of the annual cost it would take to maintain that from a maintenance standpoint, from an operational standpoint, from a staffing standpoint, to be better stewards of the taxpayer's dollar. So it's a money saving tool? No, sir, I'm saying that that's one of the rationales that's behind the proposal. Okay, I mean, we, we have two schools now, so we're not adding expenses, we still have. With combined it, it, expenditures and deferred maintenance for both of those schools, we're talking about nearly $40 million in terms of what is deferred maintenance. Correct. So I think we've made a good justification that the schools need to be replaced. The question really is, do you replace, are we replacing two schools or are you replacing one? And you all are saying that one school is necessary for a replacement for both those populations. But then when we do that, we're saying, well, we're going to add 100 kids from Weddington into that group. Well, I don't, that, that, I don't think so, that, so I think when we look at the numbers, I understand what you're saying. So the population projections over the next 10 years stipulate that one all that is needed in that area is one school. I mean, the, the data supports that. It's pretty plain and clear. Um, when you realign, you're realigning the entire district, you're looking at planning blocks, and you start, then you assess where's the best, where's the best geographic location for those kids to go. So that's kind of how that, that just plays out. Um, and pro, and, and, and there, that is a program choice school as well. So your program choice also adds to some of the things you have to plan for as you move forward. But it does not, yeah, financially it does not make sense to build two schools, especially with the long-term projections of the population that's there. You will be have underutilization that would that you'll never fill. Oh, you'd fill it. I don't. I think if we could fill it at, at Culture and Web now, we can fill it somewhere else. I mean, we do that all the time. You, depending on program, depending on no, program. Just, but anyway, that, that's. I just wanted to make that that clear. I, and I, I know I, I guess redirect my questions here to more general redistricting program. Uh, and one thing you mentioned, we don't have planning block data. We have less data now this time than we had last time when we were making a decision on where kids are moving from. Um, and it's concerning. I mean, it's a, again, I think we've lost focus. We've lost focus on the on the on this redistricting. We're talking five, six, seven different things when we really need to be talking about capacity. That was the main point on several of our presentations: is hey, we're going to be over 40,000 students. We're not going to have any room. Everybody's going to be in, in in portables, or we we won't even have enough portables to to support our students. Uh, and then we get when we get off track and we're talking about pre-k that adds zero to that we talk we talking about um, demographics doesn't change the capacity issue proximity doesn't change capacity feeder patterns we talk about all this all this other stuff I think we've got we're losing we're losing sight of what the issue is and if the issue is overcrowding we need to address overcrowding and when you go look at the data there's big questions I mean we have a nice presentation and not not knocking the presentation but the Presentation is, is is high level, doesn't go into specifics and and look at different stuff. So for example, elementary school. Um, Bethel, 70% capacity. This this program, this recommendation, we're adding 12 students. That's it. 12 to, to that. It has plenty of capacity, yet we're adding 12. Carl Furr, 95% capacity. We're not lowering that, we're adding 14, just 14. Cox Mill is 100% capacity. They're gaining 30 s students a year, and we're just reducing it by 14. That's it. Pitt School Road, 100% capacity. No change whatsoever. Harrisburg, Hickory Ridge, Odell, all these things, all these schools that are the ones that are de we're dealing with capacity, and we've got no changes to there. 
So, so that I don't see that as, as, as where the focus is. And I'll go on one other thing on a middle school level. So currently we have Roberta Road, 87%. Northwest Cabarrus, 89%. Mount Pleasant, 82%. J.M. Freeze, 76%. Hickory Ridge Middle School at 78%. Harris Road at 78%. Harold Winkler at 73%. C.C. Griffin at 76% and Concord at 47%. So none of those are over 100%. All of those have room for growth. And we're going to disrupt the lives of 1,500 kids to, to move it that doesn't adjust capacity. It, it addresses these other things. I think the focus is not where it needs to be on, on the redistricting. Well, yeah, so I, I just think if you look school yeah. to school and say, what is the impact on this? redistricting per school, I think it changes our picture a little bit. I think we need to really focus on, are we making the right impact per the school? Are, are we disrupting the, the school too much? Um, so what and, I would offer and that's in where response, I'm concerned. Mr. Walter, with all due respect, is it does address those things you mentioned. But again, this is why you cannot look at one single facet. Right. We proposed, and it was part of the presentational material that was done by cooperative, that if you were to take your current schools right now, and you were to treat utilization as the primary factor to filling seats, that what it does is it creates more haves and more have-nots. We have schools that are going to be extremely affluent, more so than what we have now, and we will have more Title I schools potentially, and we will have more schools in which you have a larger percentage of students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Again, I respect the point about utilization, but also the feeder patterns. We will be sending kids to schools and disrupting them from elementary to middle and then on to high. And it would play out that way across the district. And what that does for our transportation, and again, I know that's what this does from also our ability to serve, is it puts some extreme challenges on that. And I would still follow that up to say, when you mention those percentages, one thing that's not in there, development. Right. This has been done with future development exactly. in mind, right and it is no secret with the number of active sites that are out there in many of those communities to which you just referenced, they're about to see significant growth within the next five to ten years. So again, it, we could leave it alone. It does not address anything, and it doesn't get us out in front, and it doesn't prepare us because you also have not added capacity back in with a long-range facilities master plan, which is also included as an element. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. If you focus on one aspect, yes, sir, you're right it's not going to check the box across the board, which is why there are several key aspects and several things that must be considered. But we're not looking at each school, and we need to be looking at each school. Well, I that's think that's not we, what's happening here. We have looked at each school, though, and I think that's what Dr. Bowers is trying to articulate, is that we are projecting five, ten years out. And if you go back to when we talked to you over the last couple of presentations, I would ask the board to remember the amount of permanent buildings that are taking place right now. There are 8,000 single homes, I think it's 16,000 um, multi-unit family units that are going up. That's 24,000 homes. And that does not include all the ones that are yet to be permanent or approved that are sitting out there waiting to happen. So there are things we have to plan for. Um, and I think Dr. Bowers articulated that well. You, again, you're right. If we focus on one thing, that would be something that you, you know, I would say I would agree with you. But we're not focused on one thing. We're trying to get balance. Dr. Bowers? Yes, sir. And, and again, to... I, and I understand your point. I think that it's a fair assessment with what you offered. But one of the things that we have right now, when you, we do look at schools. I just want to be clear about that. Harris Road Middle School. Right now, that boundary as it currently exists, we have 1,875 active units right now that are projected to take place in the foreseeable future for Harris Road. There are 351 right now that are in review. If we did nothing, nothing, that's 2,226 units we're about ready to add back to that current boundary. The current boundary proposal before us, while again, doesn't reduce the utilization tremendously. It reduces the number of active units. It cuts it by two thirds. We're down to 675 active units in the new proposed boundary now. We also have 281. So we are basically reducing 1,200 to 1,300 units out of the current boundary right now for the proposed boundary to help ease that long-term overcrowding that is at Harris Road. Okay, I get that, and I think we ought to focus on Harris Road, but yes. on the other end of that spectrum, you've got Concord Middle School that has 638 stu students with a design capacity of 1,200, and 
Your five-year projection shows 343 students at 27%. How is that acceptable? See, that's, Be because that's in the, there are that's roughly 300 plus students that come out of Concord Middle School every year Concord to choice. attend other program offerings elsewhere across the district. Correct. Well, we've got to fill the school. You can't leave yes, an empty sir. school at 27 percent and worry about and highlight the, the, the other 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 issues. That's where I, that's where I'm looking looking at it. So again, I I, I appreciate it, but well, I think on that issue our too. focus needs to be more on the on the the utilization. Uh, of the schools because that's what you need to justify to the taxpayers that you might need to build another school. Well, on that issue too, you have to take in consideration the program choice options that we offer to kids. And that's always something that we're always going to be dealing with and, and taking a look at. So, I mean, that is that, I, I don't want to say it's a problem because it's wonderful that our kids have those choices. Uh, but that is something that we had talked about addressing over the next school year in 24, 25 to possibly geographically align that better throughout our system, but we can't do anything until we decide on what a realignment plan is going to be. Mr. Treadway. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just a couple of things. Um, in talking about legacy students, <clears throat> pardon my voice, um, I, I do want us to be cognizant of that. <laughs> if we allow those legacy students, we may be setting them up for a really rough, what, sixth and ninth grade because they may be going with fewer of their peers, which is what we're trying, which is what we're trying to be about. So I just want us to keep that in mind. And then the other thing, I'm, I'm circling back to what I've said before. Um, our timeline for staffing is now. I mean, we cannot, we cannot move this down the road. This this decision has to be made for staffing, and uh, I, I mean, uh, it's going to be. It's going to be a lot of work on HR as it is. So I, I, I got, I've had a lot of emails about why can't we wait and why can't we move this down for the next few months or whatever. Um, the timing, I mean, over a year ago, we said that we had to make decisions in February for lots of reasons. And one is, if, if nothing else, is the staffing and allotments and things like that that have to be decided. And to teach, treat our staffing with respect so that they have access to, you know, the the uh, transportal uh, process where they have some input on where they go. Ms. Lindsay. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so um, back to the capacity uh, uh, issue that Rob was speaking about. So Beverly Hills currently has an enrollment of 331. Culture and Web has an est uh, current enrollment of 456 after the scenario C redistricting. So that's 787 students, which is already over capacity if we're gonna build a 750 uh, 50 feet, uh, seat school. It's 105% over capacity. So if Cabarrus County builds two schools with 472 seats each, 944 total, those schools will each be at an 84% utilization on day one. So building two schools is obviously going to be, as far as utilization is concerned, um, a better option. Um, and then where did the data for the projected future enrollment on those attached on that attached slide for the verification of the 756 seat combined school come from? And mm -hmm. how do you anticipate transfers in and out and rely on that data? Yeah, that's a great question. So as far as, so there were two summaries that were provided for that. One was the live-in attend, or excuse me, the live-in. So those are students within the current boundary that if all attended, what that might look like. So it was the first set of figures that we provided in the presentation. <clears throat> the second set of figures were the projected enrollments. The enrollments factor in those things such as transfer in, transfer out. What we do find is that there are students across the board in Cabarrus County schools that are transferring out of schools every year for numerous reasons. Um, EC programming might be one, um, obviously specialized settings, program choice, which we discussed tonight. Uh, McKinney-Vento is one. Obviously, we see students that certainly uh, move quite frequently as well. And then the hardships, which were referenced earlier. So there's a multitude. On average, about 13% of students across Cabarrus County schools, the district as a whole, transfer out of their home school to attend another school. And so when we factor these things into future enrollment projections, that's what we're using, is what has been the historical transfer in out for both Beverly Hills and Coltrane Webb. 
And while it's worth noting that students do transfer into Coltrane Webb because of the popularity of the STEM program, we do see students transfer out as well. So to be able to take this year's numbers, and I know this is hard sometimes, and apply it to next year to say this is going to be the carryover in terms of the projection, that doesn't always hold up because we expect attrition over time. You have smaller grade levels. You may have a smaller or larger fifth grade class right now. Then you do a fourth grade or a third grade or a second grade, so you're losing a lot more fifth graders than you would, and you're not adding it back in with the same number of kindergartners next year. So that can fluctuate across the board. So when we do the projections, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying we did that with our own in-house demographics, and those are the most reliable projections we can get for those areas because they fuel our staffing allotments and they fuel all of our planning allotments each and every year, and they are spot on. So I, I think we have a good sense of what that might look like. Did that answer your question? Well, it, it answers it, but it also, I mean, numbers-wise, it just doesn't, I mean, they're going to be at 105% capacity as soon as they open up with 787 students. I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, yeah. that people can leave and, and mm -hmm. come in, but, I mean, the bottom line is we're about to potentially build one school that is going to be at 100% capacity as soon as it opens. Well, I think the other thing we need to consider is that'll be sort of the, uh, we start building that school this year, two years down the road, we're starting to look at those numbers, right? Again, the projections don't show that over time. I think the wild card here that we're all forgetting is it's a program choice school. And with other schools coming out of STEM schools and replacing Beverly Hills as a choice school, we control the numbers of kids going to that school. So we get to you know, that's why we have the water, that's why we have the information, that's why we go through the process of, of assigning kids to schools, which is why next year one of the things we need to start looking at is where geographically do we put our program choice schools? And that's one of the reasons that that's not just a Coltrane Web Beverly Hills issue. That's a district issue that we need to take a hard look at. And that goes that then falls into the transportation issues that we've been hearing about over the last year to make sure that we have equity across the board for all students to be able to access the hub stops. So there, they will not be at capacity in two years starting out that way because we control the numbers in terms of who gets in there for program choice. And with other schools having program choice options, which is STEM, which is STEM, we can assign kids accordingly. And there's, so the other thing is too, and this is data that I've seen, is that Enrollment in charter schools and private schools and homeschooling is increasing mm -hmm. over the years, quite a lot. So I'm not necessarily sure that our projected enrollment in public school isn't necessarily going to go down because people are choosing charter and private and homeschooling as an option much more now than they were before COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other thing, too, that I wanted to mention was that we did have uh, Beverly Hills replacement on uh, the plan um, for 2026. And that was, um, we just never went with it, but, but that definitely was on the capital plan for a rebuild. Um, and I do think that the frustration is that five years ago, we thought that we put this thing to bed. We, we, want, we stated that we wanted Beverly Hills to stay open. We put it on the 10-year master plan. And the fact of the matter is that we got no other option from cooperative strategies except for to close Beverly Hills along with this realignment. And that's where the frustration has come from people on this board and people out in the community. Ms. Sandage. If I can, and I just hate to put you on the spot, but you sitting up here and you represent our teachers and our educators. So I just wanted to see if you could offer or wanted to offer anything. You don't have to, but I think that it's important. You sit up here with us. You've heard everything that we've heard and you bring a different perspective to this board for a reason. And I just want to give you the opportunity to do that. I appreciate that. I have not heard specifically from any teachers um, voicing concern either way. The only um, information and feedback that I have heard from teaching um, from the teachers would be um, just concerns about where they would end up if they get a say in movement. If, if for whatever reason they were um, had to move, would they get a say in possible options? 
Um, and what does it look like projection if we're in some schools where you're losing teachers and then in a few years you're going to gain those teachers back um, and, and the possibility of teachers um, having to do their own shuffling either by choice or not by choice. Um, but I have not heard sp specifically from teachers that, that wanted um, questions or answers uh, through me. Um, I do appreciate that we're having conversations ahead of time. It sounds like there are plans and um, things that are in place ahead of possible decisions made so that those conversations would be easier had. Um, so I, I, I do appreciate that there is a little bit of, of that happening um, and all the potential plans um, that we, and conversations that we've had at, at board meetings. Um, I don't know that there's anything specific more that I can comment on. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Floyd? <clears throat> All right, back on slide 26. Um, so adjusting has potential to disrupt utilization, feeder patterns, proximity, and diversity. Uh, if the proposed changes to what we're doing are just temporary, and in the end, it works out the same as we have in, in scenario C plus or whatever, I can't, uh, C revised or whatever, I don't know. Um, how, how, does it, how does it disrupt if past 2026 is what I'm asking? Do you understand what I'm saying? No, sir. I, Sorry, I, I've been looking at, <laughs> I've okay. been sleeping, buddy. I understand, I, and I, I can respect that as well. Um, so, again, a lot of these things are difficult to predict out, uh, I'll be honest. One of the proposals we saw uh, had some recommendations about um, delaying some other boundary shifts and, as you said, keeping cohorts of students together during a transition. So underneath that recommendation, and that's the one I'm speaking of specifically that, that we reviewed and you know, we said what would be the implications, um, is that when there would be up to five schools within surrounding areas to which we're just more or less creating a two-year delay with any sort of shift or student movement, and, and in some cases, redirecting students. Um, what that does is that it does create challenges with, okay, now what is the median household income within that particular school? Because if you have an over-representation of some groups, um, be it more affluent or less affluent, that changes what that school makeup would be. Obviously, when you talk about a feeder pattern, um, there was one proposal to which we would have students that would be attending an a, a elementary school but yet when they transitioned out to go to middle school, they would be going to a middle school potentially that was never ever in that elementary school's feeder. Um, an example would be there was a scenario to which students from W.M. Irvin would be able to go there for a temporary um, sort of stay until new construction came online. But based on where that student was boundaried and attended, based on their physical address, their middle school would be Northwest Cabarrus Middle School. So when we talk about transference of students across boundaries to which historically has not been the case, that's, that's what it has the potential to do. And then the utilization, it, again, we saw some shifts with some of the suggestions as to what might be a, an option. We saw some schools now, we're taking them far north of what the current utilization is right now. Uh, Weddington Hills would have been one, to which we're now putting more students into Weddington Hills and going above what the recommended enrollment boundary would be. So again, that's when we look at this. How limited would that be, or would it just be for a finite period of just two years? Uh, with all I can't project that. I can only tell you what the implications would be with that proposal, should it be in place. Okay, my <clears throat> next two questions are about cost. What's, what's our delta between two smaller schools and one combined school? And then I have another cost question after that. So again, these are all projections. Okay. And again, we have to look at this based off of what would be an anticipated cost of construction in the state of North Carolina mm -hmm. based on some of the estimates we've got. So what we're looking at potentially would be about $30.5 million for about a 70,008 square foot elementary school. That would serve roughly 500 students. Okay. If we built two of those, $61 million. The R. Brown McAllister new rebuild was just completed for $48 million and it has 115,000 square feet and it can serve 756 students. Sorry, right. Let's go. Okay. 
operational cost. We talked about this a minute ago, some positions that are uh, duplication, principal, receptionist, treasurer, data manager, media specialist, ITF, cafeteria manager, head custodian, SRO, nurse, kids plus, regardless of size of school, every school has to have those positions. So one bigger school, two smaller schools, we're now talking those. From what I've been able to be told, we're talking 750 to a mil per year in total comp for those positions. Is that more or less accurate? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are we what are we looking at there? True cost difference. Yes, sir. Great question. Year over year over year over year. Great question. Um, I would say this initially. Um, again, it depends on the staff. Obviously, years of service, things like that. A very conservative estimate is going to be closer to 500 to 600 thousand. Okay. Is it likely we could have 750? The answer is yes. Okay. And that's annual overtime. For as long and as that takes into in account. I think SROs are catching the. Uh, they had salary studies, so they should be catching this healthy bump here soon, right? Are we taking that into account? That's more. That's mostly grant fund. The staffing okay. alone. We're talking about staffing alone. We're not talking operational. So that staffing. Is, that's just the staff. Staffing yeah. alone. The preliminary projection on staffing alone is somewhere between a half a million and five hundred twenty thousand. Now we're being conservative there. So that's that's what it would cost us to have the two. Not counting operational costs, all the things you mentioned that we would have to do as well. What other routine services are duplicated? deliveries, things like that. Have we looked at that? Uh, grounds, grounds maintenance grounds obviously maintenance would be right. one to which you would have in place. Obviously with any resources you would equip the school with, uh, school nutrition would be one to which we'd have to certainly work out what's going to be a viable delivery option there. Uh, transportation. Okay, school supplies. School supplies. Yes, sir. Maintenance of the two buildings versus one building. Custodial personnel. Okay. Are there other schools on our list that aren't feasible to rebuild and replace in the future? A lot of people come to me and say, don't you do it, Brian Floyd. Concord High School is next. I don't know that I've seen Concord High School on any, again, capital plan or improvement here for that. Um, I think what we would identify. If I were a man of playing favorites, I would have a favorite there, if I'm being honest. <laughs> Impartial. So plan. I'd be looking out for that. Of course. I can't say with regards to the first part of the so question. So, are there what I'm what I am saying is forget my favorite. Are there other schools that we're going to have this problem with in the future that we're going to deem are not feasible to rebuild on site, closing in the future? Are, have, has anybody looked at that? So, based on what we have right now, with our again looking at the data, based on what our current needs are, based on construction years in which they were built, based on certainly serviceability of certain sites. Um, I can think of several key projects which we've identified that weren't opportunistic for building back on its particular site. One is the Opportunity School. We have a current plan in place to be able to relocate students who are currently being served at the Glenn Center um, with, again, a newly developed Opportunity School that's located adjacent to the PLC. Another, obviously, another effort that has been identified is the replacement of Mary Frances Wall. Uh, the recommendation there is not to bring forth to the board a rebuild back on site, but to look for another site, which certainly could be, um, certainly, uh, utilized as future development there. Um, another one that when we look at this down the road, obviously R. Brown recently completed with one to which we said, okay, current rebuild there wasn't, but we could did have the space and the land available adjacent to that. And then when we look ahead, I think that that's where the long range facility master plans identify yeah. some other projects. Northwest Cabarrus High School. We're not looking for a specific rebuild back on site there. We do have other land to be able to relocate the school and expand the school for capacity while also upgrading many of its needs. Uh, but then down the road, we would also take advantage of the existing shell structure of the building itself to be able to repurpose that for a future middle school. Now, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but just identifying a couple of those mm -hmm. needs. Central Cabarrus High School, it's another one that's been identified. And all these things have in common are high facility condition indices, to which we know there's a tremendous amount of divert maintenance tied up in each of these buildings. And then obviously, as we look at it, as it relates to the square footage, and obviously as it relates to the year in which that school itself would have been built. These are things that help inform what might be some future actions there. So those are the projects I could speak to right now that we know of. Um, beyond that, I'd, I'd have to check to see what else might be a, an option future years down the road. Okay. Um, you mentioned we would have to address, this is a new one, sorry. We would have to address some major safety things that take a lot of money. Okay. Where, when we get to that point, if we got to that point, where does that money come from? That's not budgeted, right? We don't already have that? 
So that would be a conversation that county would have to support us on that um, on that initiative. If we got to that point, the county would have to give us the funding for that. But to be to be honest, I don't know that I could I could say I'd have to re, uh, defer to Brian Corn, Tim Water, and Dr. Bowers. A surprise one. On, the, on my point is on could we get that done before the school year starts? Some of those safety issues and concerns. Does <clears throat> I don't want to speak for the county. Does, I thought I've recently heard that the county isn't is officially not paying for mobiles anymore is that if i heard that correctly they said we're not to buy mobiles i have not no one has no told, surprise question sorry yeah no that's okay i have not heard i have never been told that the county will not buy mobiles my no, understanding yeah. is that there's no space to put mobiles anymore in terms of, of putting them in and they are costly for, for sure um I think two years ago the county did support us buying mobiles. Uh, that might have been the last time that we did it. Uh, I think I'd have to. Want, Chuck I, Taylor would probably be the best person to answer that. Yeah. One. My man Chuck. Good evening. Could I hear the question one more time? I just want to make sure I understand it. I I thought that I've heard, but I haven't confirmed, and I know that we can't speak for him that the county has a mandate that we're not paying for mobiles. They're not paying for mobiles anymore. Is that right? No, sir. That's okay. incorrect. Thank we you. received funding last year okay. through the budget cycle. Everything for the mobiles is ran through the budget cycle, just okay. like any other project. But space is an issue to put mobiles on, correct? Space is the issue. Uh, and the one thing that is really hard to make people understand is space where you need it is never available. There are certain sites that you need extra capacity. Well, if you had space to put the mobiles, then you could do that, but you also <coughs> hit that point where your core capacities, in other words, being able Cafeteria to feed always, them, yep. put them in the gyms, that comes into question and becomes an issue. Also, inclement weather uh, becomes an issue because we have to have enough area of safe harbor for the number of students and staff you have. I'm going to put you on the spot with another one. I'm sorry. It's okay. When it comes to moving and emplacing them, so, for example, maybe taking existing ones we have at Coulter and Beverly, moving mm -hmm. them elsewhere, what kind of expense is that? What, what are we talking roughly? I've heard it's very expensive, but I don't, you know, I'm pretty it, cheap. It it's can be very expensive, expensive anywhere from twenty-three to $40,000 today. Okay. Five years ago, that cost was almost half. That's per unit? Yes, sir. It also depends on if we have the ability, and we don't always have the ability in-house to make it a hybrid project. When I say hybrid, that means that I'm utilizing our maintenance force to do some of the work. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. It depends on what the workload is that we have. And when it comes to moving them, and I'm speaking specifically with ideas for maybe trying to keep swinging together for some of these schools, what what am I not thinking about? Do you have to have so many trailers? You have to have a toilet trailer. I mean, what is there anything code wise there? There are. It, you have to have access to a restroom within 200 feet. Ooh. So if you don't have access to a restroom within 200 feet of the physical location of the mobile, then we have to install a restroom mobile. We've done that at Mo, uh, Wolf Meadow, mm -hmm. and that's why we made the big move several years ago to these mobile complexes not only are they safer because you're enclosing an entire wing basically you also have the restroom facilities there for them it's just just a better setup okay i can take a break for a little bit sorry i know I'm no holding the mic. you guys go ahead okay yes. anybody else um i think we had a couple sorry guys miss lindsay Chuck, I'm going to put you on the spot, too, real quick. I'm sorry. I love but it. But I have – I know you can handle it. I know you can. Um, I have had some discussions with some people, and, and there's some, some rumors out there. So I want to put those to rest with you. Sure. Um, when we present a budget to the county commissioners for deferred maintenance, which we have done for – years and years because deferred maintenance has been an issue for years and years yes ma'am 
when they give us money for the deferred maintenance, they do not fund all of the deferred maintenance that we have. They never have. They take a certain number of items that are labeled as the most important things that need to be done for that year and they then give us the money to have those maintenance issues handled. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Can I elaborate a Please. little bit? So, Please do. I've told this board before, all sources of conflict, including this one tonight, is about resources. I want to be careful that I don't characterize any way that the county is not supporting us when I answer this because they are. I know they are. I've worked with them for 10 years. We are so much further now than we were 10 years ago. Okay? So when I say this, please understand, they have a lot of needs on their side. With all this growth, it's not just school system. It's ambulances. It's police. It's everything. We all compete for the same tax dollars. So when I say this, they give us what they decide they can apportion to us and then they decide what projects that we pick out and submit to them. To be honest with you, we have 12 different disciplines of maintenance. The maintenance group goes through and decides the top three items in each of those disciplines and then we ask the county to fund the items in the top 36. One year they may have $8 million to give us, one year they may, and I'm just making these numbers up, so don't hold me to these. One year it might be $11 million. We go through those items as we have prioritized them, and they fund the top ones that we tell them are prioritized. Correct. So that's how that process works. Does that answer your question? No, right? it absolutely does. It, so, it absolutely does. I want this rumor that is circulating out there that for some reason that when when we receive this money for the maintenance that we're not performing the maintenance that we said that we needed this money for so let me dispel that right now okay thank you i personally take offense to that rumor i agree because we do far more maintenance with the dollars we're given than the list of items normally we're knocking out as much as we can say they give us money to accomplish 15 projects on that list. I don't think there's been a single year yet that we haven't accomplished more than those 15 items. I agree. And I and I and that's why I wanted you to dispel that rumor because I also took personal offense to it because I've seen the work that you do and I've seen the work that your group does and it's amazing what you have been able to do with not receiving the deferred maintenance money that you should have been getting all of this time. So I just want you to dispel that. So thank you. Thank you for all of the work that you do because you have done a wonderful job with the money that you have received to keep up with these schools. So let me just say on that note, I have 85 people that do a wonderful job. Agreed. I just get to represent yes. them. You, so board, all of you. Board members, is there any other questions about the information that we've been presented with realignment review. Okay, I think we're finished. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll go to 8.02 in our construction update with Mr. Brian Cohn. Welcome, Mr. Cohn. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Get the presentation queued up here. So this is your update on all things construction from the month of January. So we'll start with R. Brown McAllister. They have been working um, in all areas of the school on the new UPO floor. Again, that is the no wax floor that we install in the school. So uh, as a reminder, this school has it uh, in its entirety. So there's no waxing required in any of R. Brown McAllister. Um, interior painting continues to take place in multiple areas. Uh, fencing has been completed around the art patio and the EC patio. Uh, kitchen equipment is going through its startup phase of testing with the contractor and the kitchen equipment vendor. Uh, all the ceiling tiles are installed throughout the building at this point. Our carpet tile installation is about 90% complete throughout the project now. Um, the building automation systems are being tested throughout and brought online as they are tested. 
those are receptacle controls, lighting controls, uh, the mechanical controls for heating and air. Uh, the projector and the projector screen installation is still ongoing in the gematorium. Uh, and we've performed our smoke test of the plumbing system uh, with our FMD team, making sure that there are no uh, open pipes anywhere hidden in the walls. Fire inspections have also started throughout the building. Our bi-directional amplification system, or the BDA as we like to call it, uh, has been tested and approved by the fire marshal. Uh, our, all our flow tests uh, on the FTC and the system inside the building have been tested and passed on flow and pressure. Uh, electrical devices can continue to get trimmed out throughout the building. Uh, the exterior turf areas that we programmed in this school, about 90% complete, we're waiting on some sunshade structures to finish that up. Uh, the walking trail around the multipurpose field has been completed. You'll see in some pictures here shortly. Uh, the paving is complete around the entire site. So fire lane, uh, all the parking areas, the bus entrance, the bus loop, the parent drop off, all those areas are paved and completed. Uh, we are scheduling our owner punch list over the next couple weeks to begin walking the building with the contractor and our FMD team. Uh, and we were um, uh, privileged several weeks ago, we were able to tour Charlotte Mecklenburg School System. They called and reached out and asked to come and look at some of our f finishes that we utilize and some of the design strategies. And we were able to take them to three of our schools. So I thought that was worth noting. It's a picture of the cafeteria. And there's the, the bus slide in the foreground, the parent loop, uh, staff and visitor parking. Uh, just a couple images here. That's the uh, the chiller and boiler pump room, uh, and then you can see interior painting is uh, beginning to finish up there in the media center. Uh, shot there of our second and third grade group uh, restrooms. Uh, then the image on the right that is the new student bus entrance. Uh, then that's the looking at the main entrance courtyard area coming out from the media center where. Uh, car riders uh, will be dropped off and picked up at. There's a, a image of the fourth and fifth grade classroom hall, uh, as well as one of the fourth and fifth grade classrooms. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, obviously, we're on the tail end of this project, uh, a little bit, uh, about 11% left on what we have to do. Substantial completion is still tracking with Rogers Builders uh, for the last week of March. Uh, so we're coming up on that. Uh, and uh, as of this past week's OAC meeting, we should still hit that target date. Uh, that's just an image there of the uh, kitchen area and the equipment set up, the epoxy floors. So the certificate of occupancy is different than the substantial completion. Do what? Certificate of occupancy is different than the substantial so Rogers has, is a little um, unique to this. Their substantial completion is handing over of the building to us. Um, so yes, that, the phrasing of it on their schedule says substantial completion, but that is occupancy date that they will hand the building to, over to us. And that's an aerial, updated aerial image showing the bus entrance there on the right, parent, student uh, car rider drop off on the left. There's the new multi-purpose field, the back side of the campus with the walking trail. Uh, two playground structures should be delivered within the next two weeks. Uh, basketball court structure uh, will be here probably by the end of February is the delivery date on that. A quick update on the road improvements that are a part of this project. So the mast arm submittals, uh, the signalization poles, they have been approved by both City of Concord and NCDOT. Uh, lead times do continue to track about 20 weeks on those poles, uh, quite, quite a lengthy lead time to obtain those poles. Um, we are working with Cabarrus County and the real estate group on finalizing the purchase of the public maintenance easements that we have to acquire along Union Street that are a part of this roadway improvement package. Um, uh, again, the, the purchase of this property is well within the funds that we still have available to us in the land account that we utilize for acquisitions such as this. Um, 
just to be clear though, I wanna let you know this roadway project is gonna get to the very end uh, based on the length of time to receive the signalization poles. Uh, it'll, it'll be late June into July when we'll be wrapping this up. So uh, we'll just keep an eye on it and watch the schedule and push them as hard as we can. And I believe that's all I had on R. Brown. Are there any questions? Any discussion, board members? Mr. S Floyd? Spoken to a representative of the second grade recess team. What comments did he uh, have? They specifically wanted me to ask you tonight if it's too late to add a football field. So, quote, Tom Brady will come play football with them <laughs> at recess. So I told him I'd ask. Well, tell, tell Mr. Bain we will do all that we can. Please do. Okay. Miss Sanders. By football, you mean soccer, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, Dr. Kapicki? Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, good. Anybody else? Thanks for the presentation. I had a question about uh, traffic when we have two schools in operation there. Okay. What does that look like? So we are working with district transportation on a model that will change the tiers of those schools so they are not uh, arriving and dismissing at the same time unconfirmed and solidified yet on that plan, but that is what we're working towards. Can you just keep us abreast on what yes, that looks like? I just want to know what you that looks like. Any other questions? Ms. Escobar? This is about turf and the floors. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious there's a benefit that you don't have to wax the floors, um, but they still have to be mopped, right? I mean, it doesn't cut the, <laughs> the yeah, cut the work completely. We are still cleaning the floors. Yes. Okay. Um, it reduces our maintenance equipment or our custodial equipment cost because it's an additional machine that you have to okay. purchase for the waxing. So it cuts that cost down. Um, you know, plus it, it, the, the safety factor, the length of time, the resources, the available manpower to do that work over the summer months is what puts such a strain on our custodial department. And being able to eliminate that from, from this particular project was uh, uh, instrumental. And is that also the benefit for having turf? Like you see the playgrounds and you see from the aerials, you can see that. So I'm guessing you don't, ha you don't have to mow. You still probably have to blow it with, if there's leaves and stuff. But. Yeah, but, but we have eliminated much of the mowing maintenance directly associated with where the kids are gonna be. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give a continuous playing surface for these students, rain or shine. As soon as it rains, if it gets sunny and they wanna go outside, they can. If it were grass and it were muddy, they wouldn't have the ability to do that. Okay. Uh, plus Thank Chuck always uh, argues with me about blowing rocks into windows and things. So. <laughs> Is there any other questions? How often does the turf have to be replaced? Uh, longevity on this type of turf is 15 to 20 years. Uh, and it, it's all depending on the wear and tear and how much use it gets. Anything else, board members? Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Yep. All right, we'll t uh, touch on Northwest Cabarrus High School real quick. So construction documents are about 80% complete. Um, we did receive our 50% CD budget uh, by Shell Co., the CM at risk, uh, this past December. Uh, again, the cost of construction is still tracking based on that pricing exercise at roughly $114 million for the high school project, that's site development and building cost. Uh, that does represent about $405 a square foot uh, for what needs to be developed for the high school itself. Um, the design firm is in the final stages of submitting the plans to NCDPI for their review in February. Uh, we do continue tracking value engineering items with the co construction manager at risk as well as the architect as we move into our final pricing exercise, which will be at about 95% CDs. Again, we will kind of push pause on this project at that point until we get a little bit more definitive timeline on the funding schedule from Cabarrus County and what that looks like. Uh, that's just our updated uh, Revit model of the site there on the right. There's the rendered elevation that Marsburg has provided us looking at the front of the school. That's the main commons area as you enter from the security vestibule. That would be the gymnasium on your left and the auditorium on your right going down through that atrium area. Uh, this is kind of the culmination of the spines of the building. The, the um, I'm not sure what they're going to call it. They, I think they said Northwest Square, or Trojan Square of some sort. But uh, this is right outside the, the um, cafeteria, the dining area, the classroom wing. So it's a, a big gathering area that can be utilized uh, for various uses. And then that's the media center on the second floor overlooking that area. Questions on Northwest? 
Any questions? I do want to just make a comment. Five years ago, how much would it have cost us to build this school? Five years ago? Uh, we would have, we initially had budgeted this school at $80 million. $80 million, and now it's $114 million. Yeah, so, and that's consistent. Uh, some of the CMS schools have gone higher than that in terms of square foot cost. Thank you. <laughs> A uh, real quick update for you on the Central Cabarrus Tennis Court project. Um, obviously, weather has been a major factor in this. That what we did get the net post and center anchor post installed. Um, they are going to be pouring the sidewalks this week, weather permitting. Uh, they are also going to begin surface work on the uh, crack repairs on the existing courts uh, that need to happen before they'll be able to put the pro bounce system down. We have identified with the contractor the first week of March to bring all that material in and delivered ready to begin the process and it will take about two weeks to install the pro bounce system weather permitting. Uh, that does give us the ability to still hold the, uh, men, the men's tennis season the last half of the spring season at that campus. So. Any questions on Central? All right, moving on to Hickory Ridge. So the track update, so the rubberized surface is completed. Um, it is red, as you can see there. Uh, track uh, striping actually began last week. They were able to get started and they wrapped up today. They'll have a little bit of punch work left to take care of, but they did uh, finish the striping today over there. So uh, within the next week, they'll be 100% done and be ready for use of the track season upcoming. And that's all I had. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I did that slide. Um, so I just thought this was worth pointing out. So we were um, asked by the, uh, the STEM program at Cultural Web Elementary School if we would come and give a little presentation on quadrilaterals and how they align with school design. So I thought, thought it was worth noting. Um, one of the Marsburg representatives joined me. Uh, we presented to two different class, classes earlier this week. Uh, gave them sheets of various shaped quadrilaterals, showed them how we kind of pl plan a site out with these shapes, uh, and gave them the ability to cut those shapes out in groups and kind of design their, their own school on the site plans. Is, uh, it was probably one of the more fun things I get to do in my job. So I just thought it was worth noting. Um, many of them designed the schools within the pond because they felt like we needed a pool. Um, <laughs> They put hallways over the creek, so as they said that was a bridge. So it was uh, it was quite interesting to see the creativity that they afforded us. So, and then that was all. So, thank you. Any other questions? Yep. I'm just going to stay here with you. Okay, we'll move to 9.01. These will be our consent or action items: architectural contract approval for the Opportunity School. Mr. Tim Louder and Brian, Mr. Brian I'll Kiner, just, just you? I'll just take care okay. of it, yeah. Uh, so Cabarrus County Schools Department of Construction, along with counsel from Johnson, Allison, Horde, have negotiated with Morris Berg Architects the contract for the design and construction administration of the new replacement opportunity school. Tonight we are, represent, we are presenting to you the B133 2019 standard form of agreement between owner and architect, construction manager's constructor edition for your approval. The total approved contract, sorry, the total contract for approval for design and construction services is in the amount of $585,000. This amount is a part of the total project budget included in the fiscal year, fiscal year 24 capital budget approved last year by Cabarrus County. The fee covers all phases of design and development as well as the construction administration and final closeout of this project. Once approved, Marsburg will begin immediately with the schematic design drawings to finalize the overall layout of the building and required spaces that are a part of the initial program in the spaces. And I'll be ha happy to answer any questions you may have about this. Any questions, board members? Mr. Walter? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yes, is sir. the fee a percentage of the total cost? Fee or? is a percentage. Uh, we had to go through programming to kind of identify square footage so we could establish what that construction cost looked like, and it is uh, roughly 6.5% of the total construction cost. Okay. And then where exactly is the school going? Uh, we are, have identified the additional uh, property that we own at the uh, behind the PLC campus that was a part of that acquisition from NCDOT years ago when we uh, acquired it uh, because of the, the, the piece of property that was cut off when the parkway is developed. But it's not going to have access to the parkway? Or will it, it will not have access to the parkway other than emergency vehicular access. 
Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Okay, is everyone in agreement to put this on the consent agenda for our February 12th business session? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board members, we will move to 9.03, which is our policies for approval on first read with Dr. Sandy Ward. Good evening, Dr. Ward. Good evening, board members, Dr. Kopicki, Ms. Fugel. Uh, tonight, I have for you three policies that I'm bringing forth on a first read. I did not receive any questions, but before I start, just want to check. All right. Uh, policy 4040-7310, Student Staff Relations. Um, this was brought forth because there was a, a legal requirement that was um, new for the general statute that was just passed. So that was the reason for the revision. Any questions? That one? Any questions, board members? Okay. Okay. Uh, policy 4110 is the immunization and health requirements for school admission. Uh, this revision was brought forth because it eliminates reference to the Governor's Commission on Early Childhood Vision Care, which no longer exists. So it was pulled out of the policy, but the policy was kept intact. Any questions? Okay. Okay, and the last policy is 4240-7312, Child Abuse and Related Threats to Child uh, Safety. Uh, it was revised to reflect legal requirements in the new state law, uh, General Statute 115C-326. Any questions? Okay. 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 Board. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ward, I know Mr. Walter and I are on the policy committee, sure. and so we're involved in this. I really like the summary that you provided for sure. us. I thought that was very helpful, so I, 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 I thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. Okay, board members, are we all in agreement to put this on the consent agenda for our next business session? Okay, thank you. We'll move to 9.04, our budget summary and board report with Mr. Phil Penn. Welcome, Mr. Penn. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members. Good to be with you again. Uh, in the spirit of Groundhog Day, didn't we just do this? Um, I want to mostly talk to the document that says February 2024 financial summary memo, 0224. If we could pull that up. Now go down a bit. It's the one, the last one. That's it. So one of the things I mentioned at the last board meeting was to put together sort of a narrative memo that sort of explains both um, the changes that are taking place within the amended budget and kind of a view of where we are right now, right, which supports the other exhibits that we've developed during this year to sort of say, you know, across all our different funds, how are we doing so far? So within fund one, most of the changes that you're going to see in the amended budget uh, reflect bail bonuses that are going to be paid to staff according to the DPI determined formulas. I know um, my, my payroll folks and the HR folks have been working on that pretty aggressively for the past week or so. Uh, you'll also see that the state dropped about $900,000 in textbook funding that was anticipated. And this is, this is uh, I should probably, probably would have reworded this a little bit differently. We were a little bit disappointed to hear that the advanced teaching role grant that we won recently we thought we were going to wind up seeing about $400,000 this year that would have gone toward actually paying some of that, but the, the state has said instead we're going to receive $150,000 for 23-24 to be a planning year. So the planning will take place this year. Uh, the, the actual um, utilization of those funds in the grant will take place 24-25? Yeah, okay. Uh, but again, we're very delighted to have been awarded in that cohort, so we look forward to using that and getting through the planning period this year. Uh, within Fund 3, you're going to see a change related to more funding in our IDEA grant. Uh, IDEA is specifically so targeted to supporting our EC students, as you may know. Uh, and lastly, there was a minor adjustment in Fund 8 uh, related to a grant that we got from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture for food purchases that will benefit our student nutri school nutrition program, or SMP. Um, I'll, I'll cover the last bullet point on the page first because I was actually at the Board of Commissioners meeting earlier this evening 
they favorably voted to say we can use the $800,000 I had proposed in one-time funds to help close this year's deficit. That was already in my forecast for what we thought the deficit was going to be this year. So as of right now, as I stand here, um, we think we're down to somewhere in the neighborhood of $550,000. And that includes some emergency level repairs. We've had to free up for the facilities and maintenance uh, department uh, to perform repairs in HVAC and, and our fire alarm systems. So those were things we had to move fairly quickly on. Um, at this point, uh, you know, th these numbers change on almost a daily basis. I I've literally started taking a, a running total in an Excel file of ins and outs, good and bad, into that file. And as you might expect, and as I said to the Board of Commissioners only tonight, we're still working pretty aggressively to cl close that gap by the end of the year. Um, you know, it, we look for every lever that we can pull that we can, and I, I remain hopeful that we can close, get that down to a zero by the end of the year. So, questions? Any questions, board members? Ms. Escobar? Thank you. Um, 550000 sounds like a lot of money for me. Um, like if it was my budget, but can you put that in perspective uh, for the entire budget? Because yeah. um, I I don't. How doable is this? I know you're good. I know you're smart. I'm lo you're looking at it, but I just I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, I I feel like we're I see sacrifices we're making in this building. Um, how what's that impact on schools? So so almost never will you hear me use the word I as we describe this process. It's a we and particularly my team behind me and working with the senior leadership team that's here tonight. Um, I, I guess I would say consider that we have a $90 million local budget. Consider that we have a $507 million total budget for the running the district across all funds. Um, I'm not going to say that's a blip because it's not, right? It, it's real money, right? And I stay awake some nights wondering about what the next lever is to pull to get down to that. Um, but I, I feel pretty confidently we will turn it up. Uh, you know, we, we've been working pretty aggressively at this for about two months now, um, and that work's just going to have to continue until we have it solved. But, but in the grand scheme of that, I think it's important to consider it's 550000 within a $90 million local, and as I said, over half a billion dollars in total. Yeah. Ms. Lindsay? All right, so I'm all about dispelling rumors tonight, okay? Boy. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but there is this rumor that's going around in the schools yes. that apparently this shortfall had something to do with some kind of fraudulent activity or that money was taken from the account where it shouldn't have been taken from so could you please just in a nutshell explain very quickly how this shortfall happened so that we can dispel these rumors that are going around in the schools right now. Yeah, so well, let, be, let me before, state before you begin, emphatically, there's been zero fraudulent activity. So I just want to state that, and then Phil can kind of walk you through this. But sure. it basically came down to an allocation last May when we did the local budget. There was a $5 million allocation back in September of 2022 yeah. to plug the $5 million hole in for that budget. In 2023, when we did the 23-24 budget, that $5 million was never plugged in because you can't keep hitting your fund balance. Right. So we had a month where we had no CFO. Phil came on board. We did the review of everything, looked at it, realized that $5 million had not been allocated, which then proceeded the issues that we have right now to turn to take a look at the budget and say, okay, how do we plug that gap? because you cannot keep going back to your fund balance and taking five or six or seven, whatever the numbers, out of your fund balance. That's your savings account. If you keep hitting that, as we all know, it's at zero. There's nothing to take. And when you need something, God forbid, a crisis hits. Um, so that's the general look. Phil, if you want to give any more details, but I want to emphatically say there has been no fraudulent activity. This was a budget um, shortfall that we had to address. And if we didn't address it this year, it's not going away. You have to address that shortfall and make sure that you address it so that we can be set up for 24, 25 moving forward that we don't have this issue pop up again. But Phil, anything else you yeah, want to no, add no, to no. that? that? That's exactly right. When, when you go back and you look and see it, how the 23, 24 budget was created initially, it was on the anticipation of being able to use $5 million out of the fund balance. And as you see from prior presentations, it's not there. I mean, we have fund balance there, but under current board policy, you can't access it at this point. So we have to find other means that as we saw things develop, and if you recall the timing, the state passed a budget the first week of October. 
We didn't get numbers until about October 23rd. We spent three weeks figuring out what the impact of all that was because there were a few surprises in there that we had not anticipated when the 23-24 budget was initially created. And then we had to react. And, and, and that was how we wound up in the deficit position that we were in. The good news is, if you can call it that good news when you're talking about a deficit, is we caught it early, right? We caught it when there was still time to address the problem. If you catch a $5 million deficit at the end of May, that becomes a lot harder to try and fix than when you catch a $5 million deficit when you're sitting there in November and in December. And to fraudulent activity? There is none that I'm aware of. And, and we, we do a lot of processes around that in internal audits that we perform to make sure that that's not there. And there are checks and balances across the system to make sure that it's very, very difficult to issue anything in the way of a fraudulent payment. Any other questions? Ms. Sanded? We talked a few meetings ago about a plan going forward and that you were going to take some time to identify that, and I just didn't know where you were in that process. So let me say this. Uh, you know, uh, the answer is yes to your question, but when you're checking the accounts overdrawn, you're more focused on fixing that than you are about how much money you're going to put in your savings account going forward, right? And that's kind of where we're focused right now. Um, I think there are, having talked with a number of other CFOs across the state, uh, it's been interesting to turn up how few districts have fund balance policies and how those fund balance, balance policies operate. So I think there's an opportunity to look at the current policy to say, what do we want this to do going forward? Because the way I look at it right now, there's $7 million trapped on the balance sheet that will not benefit kids this year. And the reason is, the way the policy reads, you cannot appropriate anything out of that unless it's over 12%. So between 7%, excuse me, 8% and 12%, the money sits there. So unless I was to come to you and say, waive the policy, that money cannot be used to, current, to, to solve the current year deficit. And what's in the current fund balance right now, Mr. Penn? Around 7.2, 7.3 million. Thank you. It's almost exactly 8% of the $90 million county appropriation. According to policy? Yes. Thank you. And I think what I'm asking is, what I understand is we were continually using fund balance, and that's how we got to where we are right now. That's correct. And we should not be using fund balance unless I, it's I don't personally believe so. That's right, because, because that's not a sustainable model, as you might expect. Right. And that conversation actually came up with the Board of Commissioners tonight in that meeting uh, where members of the leadership team for the county said the same thing, uh, that that's, that's not a sustainable structure going forward. So that's the plan I'm asking for. Do we have a plan or are you working on a plan that will help us to understand how we stop using fund balance from year to year? That's what I was talking about. I would consider that part of the 24-25 budget process, right, which we've been working on for some time. We obviously need to construct a budget that reflects the fact that we can't rely on fund balance going forward. And I think when I eventually come to give a high-level review uh, to the county leadership and to come here with a, with a board proposal for the, for the budget for 24-25, that's what's going to be reflected that you can't anticipate using that going forward. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Floyd? So in other words, our plan is stop approving a budget that uses the fund balance for recurring costs. I wouldn't put words in the board's mouth, but I would, I was, I would okay. not come so to you with a budget. So we've got a responsibility in this How about state? I would not come to you with a budget that okay. suggests that? Yeah. And then have the austerity measures been addressed down to the ground level to the people that they're affecting. People have to go out and buy supplies. Have they just been told no more buying supplies unless approved? Do they understand what's going on and why we're doing this? Well, uh, that's I, I would my say next I'd question. Come I want to make sure we're addressing likely, that down to the ground. I, I, I've likely come off a couple of Christmas card lists this year, and I understand that, right? Because nobody likes to hear the word no, right? However, uh, we are reviewing those purchases on an ongoing basis, and, and, and the, the direction that was given very clearly was order what you need to to keep sustaining your school going forward, right? It's the stuff that can be deferred. It's the stuff that's not time sensitive. It's the stuff that's, that's a want versus a need. That's the stuff we're saying no to right now. But I want to make sure that they understand why this is going on and why they're having to do that. I just, yeah, I, 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 I'm I mean, confident we have. I just want to address yeah. this in public. We, we spent a fair amount of time, and I want to say it was the pre-K-12 meeting in November, going through the why behind it, how we got to where we are. Um, and one of the commitments I made to them, and this was all the principals and administrators I'm speaking to that was in that meeting, is let's fix it for this year and make sure we have it right going forward, right? So this becomes a one-year event that we're not constantly chasing a deficit. 
Because I've lived through that environment where I've been before, and I can tell you it's, it's not a pleasant place to be. Any other questions, board members? Is everybody in agreement to put this on the consent agenda for our business session? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Penn. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, board members, we'll move to 10.01, where we will have a vote on our closure of Beverly Hills Elementary School. I call for a motion to close Beverly Hills Elementary School. Discussion. We'll have that after we do this. After copious data going back to August 14th and after countless small group meetings, I make a motion that Beverly Hills Elementary School be closed at the conclusion of the 2023-24 school year. Is there a second? <clears throat> okay, hearing none. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. So we have a motion by Mr. Treadaway, a second by Ms. Escobar. Is there any discussion? Ms. Lindsay? So one question that I have is um, I know that part of the process for closing a school is to query the state. Have we queried the state to let them know that we are closing this school and if so is there not uh, a deadline that we have to maintain for that and has that deadline passed? Mr. Wilder? Okay, evening. Um, according to the state guidelines and the practices for closing the school, um, we have to identify the school as being a closure. Once the board approves to do that, then we send the information to the state informing them that we are closing the school. It's not an approval process by the state. It's only an information process to the state. Okay, so they don't have to be queried for a certain period of time. Uh, the only thing that they would be interested in is if we have a thing of historical nature, we do have to fill out that form that says this is on a historical register or something like that. But it does not meet that qualification. So that, that query does not have to be done prior to closure. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to take this moment, if you don't mind, to have a personal privilege, if that's okay. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions okay. by the board members. All right. Mr. Walter, discussion. well discussion. Yeah, I had a few few items as well. Um, I think it starts, or at least what I struggle with, is again, every student matters. And we have Beverly Hills, a su successful school with growth uh, for these students. So the students are succeeding. We have a uh, uh, exceptional principal and staff. We'd be breaking that up. That's problematic for me. We're treating this different, this community different than Mount Pleasant. We're a limit. We would be eliminating the small school option that we would have, that we have in Cabarrus County Schools, which is another thing I think it's important. Um, I'm concerned where the kids are going. You have Urban, which is language immersion. You have Weinkoff, which is language immersion, and even more concerning is Royal Oaks, which is an art school. Uh, part <coughs> of the the uh, recommendation here had Royal Oaks had. 500 kids, uh, 568 capacity, and it would move the, the students to 637, which is well over 100%, and then all of a sudden it's at 800. So the only way that's, that changes is, you know, Royal Oaks is a, not only an elementary school, it's also a middle school arts, arts school, so we're messing with the seats for that, and that's concerning to me as well. Um, you know, the other big thing is our Released at our meeting with the county commissioners, this replacement school is not funded. Um, there wasn't in their budget. They've got to come up with that funding. That it's a big if. Um, we could, if we wanted to, keep the kids together, or keep the school open while you rebuild the school, and that's not even an option that we have to consider. Um, I'm kind of disappointed. I'm, I am disappointed with the lack of engagement with the community group that that's work, put in all the work to give us options to discuss. If, um, cost savings is another issue. I mean, we're, I, I, I get that. I'm try, I see we're trying to save some costs, but yeah, we're spending $11 million on a, on a pre-K and not focused on, 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 on a school uh, for our K-5. Uh, 
And lastly, really, it's legacy. I don't really want to be associated with uh, having closed a successful school. So I'm uh, not in favor of this motion. Just, so I appreciate the, the insight and, and the opinions. I respect that. I just wanted to point out that um, we have gone over everything that's been sent to us and looked at everything, um, reviewed it. I also walked that school last week with a member of the SOS community to point out some of the concerns that we had. I took that time with Brian Cohn, and he and I walked through that school with a member of that that, that group. So, you know, we did we did engage with that particular community group. If that's what you're if that's what you're referring to. So I just want to point that out that we did take the time to review every option, every presentation, and uh, again, I we did walk through the school with one of the representatives. So we I, I feel as though that. That's fair. That's no, that's fair. So I just want to point out there in case you're unaware. So um, we d we did we certainly did try. Any other? <coughs> Mr. Treadway, did you have anything? No, no. Okay. <coughs> any other questions or any discussion? Well, I, 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 I know. I'm just making sure nobody else has anything. I, I have a few things. Okay, Ms. Sandage. So, throughout all of this process, there has been a lot of discussion. There's been a lot of heartburn. I've had a lot of sleepless nights, as I know many people um, on this board and many people in our community have had, um, and I, I don't take those things for granted. I look at this a little differently from probably a lot of people. I look at it from a social work standpoint, and um, I have an ethical responsibility to ensure that I am doing what's right by people, regardless of how many people there are. Each one is an individual. The other thing I want to say about this that really struck uh, a chord with me, um, nobody has asked me to close this school. No email has come from anybody in our community wanting to close this school. That spoke volumes to me. Uh, my mother in her 70s um, doesn't really pay attention to what's going on in the community. Uh, she asked me about Beverly Hills and it was because my son attended Beverly Hills and that school changed his life. I went from a kid getting a call every single day from his school because he was under the table. He was screaming, went to Beverly Hills, all that stopped. So that tells me that small neighborhood schools matter. They are important. And again, as a social worker, I will not and cannot sign on to disrupting already disenfranchised students in a community that have thrived and I cannot support that. Ms. Lindsay. So first I want to say um, I have been, it has been mentioned um, that these decisions uh, that may or may not have be made are for political reasons. I can tell you right now, nothing that I do is based on a political reason. I don't vote to keep a school open because I may or may not lose votes in the next race that I'm running. I vote to keep a school open because it's important to me, because it's important to you, because it's important to this community. I've been told that small schools and neighborhood schools are a thing of the past. Well, they don't have to be. They are the heartbeat of what a community is. It matters to you. Big schools are not always the answer. Opportunities for kids to have in a community, whether it be a charter school, be able to be homeschooled, a private school, a larger school, and even a community school are important. And that's what makes Cabarrus County special. That's what makes us different than every other community. I could never vote to take that away from our children. You guys have been compelling. You have came and shared your stories, and they're beautiful stories. I've, t I've toured or, um, Beverly Hills myself multiple times. I've met with many of the students, many of the parents, the janitor. Tears. Tears. Please don't close our school. You've watched big schools be built throughout this county, and you're not asking for much. You just want your little school to be there and for us to rebuild that little school into the, to the community school that you love. Five years ago, I voted 
to keep that school open and I will vote to keep the school open again. Mr. Treadaway. <clears throat> again, pardon my voice. Um, well, I guess one of the things I wanted to make, uh, make clear is that um, Beverly Hills is a special place for me as well. Both of our boys matriculated through there. Um, in fact, Risa, my wife, was very, very active. Uh, she was the parent rep on many county committees. We still, at our home, refer to a bad day as a sad buster day <laughs> because that was the, if you misbehaved in class, you, were, you received a sad buster. It was a special place, but let me, I guess I want to point out that it was a special place, not because of the brick or the mortar. It was a special place because of the leadership of people like Scott Padgett and Colleen Sane. It was a special place because of the folks that took care of our boys, like Ms. Stroman, Ford, Cummings, even after school, Emily Freeman and Dave Goff, Sarah Diebler and Crystal Turney, who is doing miracles at Boger right now. And that's my point. To our students, it's the people. It's the people. That's what makes the school special. It was not uncommon for my wife to come pick up our kids who were in Kids Plus, and they would beg her to come back later to pick her up. She loved the place because she loved the people. So I'm looking at this from a kid perspective. They can't vote. They can't vote. And that's the voice that I'm hoping to bring to this conversation. Mr. Floyd. <sighs> Unlike a lot of people in the process, I'm from here. A lot of the people that I've heard from, I'm from here. I went to school here. I went to Beverly Hills. I went to the old Concord Middle, which was the old Concord High, which was once the new Concord High. I didn't just grow up here though, I'll die here too. I don't get to retire to the beach. I don't get to move close to their grandkids. My daughter's buried here. I will never leave. And these people that we've heard from, they're not nameless faces to me. They're not potential votes. These are my people and I will die with them. My best friend in the world his wife and kids, his parents whose house I grew half, halfway grew up in, two of my favorite teachers been there for me beyond the classroom for years, my son's friends and families, my next door neighbor, the surgeon who gave my dad emergency surgery last year, one of my closest friends and business partners, the doctor who drew us a picture to explain how broken our daughter's heart was. I told her she needed a new one. She held our hand and cried with us in our worst moment, the same doctor, told us our next daughter's heart was perfectly normal and cried with us again. These people are not just the public to me. They are threads in the fabric of who I am forever intertwined with me. And there's nobody in this room that has a greater appreciation for what we're talking about. And so from that standpoint, the decision seems easy. I still feel and believe every single word I said five or six years ago. Today, I don't just represent myself, my friends, my neighbors. I am charged with making a district-wide decision as best for the district of 35,000 plus kids. Not the popular decision. That's not leadership. They would all love neighborhood schools. And I am stuck in this horrible dilemma, and I have been stuck in this horrible dilemma, and I'll never forgive you guys for putting me here, between something I want more than anything else and the answer that I fear is right. Growth is our real problem. We didn't cause it. We do have to deal with it. I was here when Pillow Techs and Philip Morris closed. I know a lot of you were too. I'd rather be dealing with growth than the other thing. Unlike some folks, I'm not seeking any votes or anything like that. I'm here to lead and just do what's right and then I will be gone. Regardless of what that ultimately means for me. I'm not going to tell people what they want to hear or kick this can down the road and make a promise I know the future cannot deliver to avoid it and save myself. I'm not going to hide from it. 
unfortunately, that integrity apparently makes me the swing vote here tonight, which seems about right, I guess. That's been my life story. This is one of the toughest decisions I've ever been faced with as a leader. I've had this finger on a trigger, and I've had to make decisions on if somebody lives or I take their life in an instant. Many, many times, pull the trigger and risk killing an innocent man, maybe a kid. Don't, and I risk that bad guy killing me or my people. Many, many times. I have sent men into situations I know we weren't all coming back from many, many times. But that was the job. Yet this is possibly the most difficult position I've ever been put in. But this is the job. It is not life or death. But it is for life. And it is something I will have to live with until I take my last breath. Like most difficult decisions, both sides are right. I have researched this exhaustively in just the six months I've been on the board. I have talked to and met with countless people countless times, despite what they're telling you out there. It's all that I've done. And I've been very honest and transparent from the very beginning with each of them. I don't want to get your hopes up. I can't just rubber stamp something that sounds good on the surface because I want to. I have turned this world upside down looking for solutions, and I know many of our staff has as well, often just to appease me, usually because they believe it deserves their full attention. We don't want to miss something while we're doing something this major. I've gotten second and third and fourth expert opinions rather than just trusting what I've been told and waiting for the next board meeting or two by two to get told more information and accepting the one that says what I like. I humbly say, I don't think anyone can say I haven't put in the honest work on this, and if they do, it's only because I don't reach the conclusion they want me to. I haven't run from anyone. I haven't just responded to as many people as I can. I've proactively reached out to people that I know care, but might not know how to approach me about it. In fact, two of them, who I won't drag into this by naming, are the most historically and emotionally vested people here that could possibly be in Beverly Hills. And not only do they both understand what has to happen they support it. One said something that stuck. I'm going to keep my SOS sign in the yard because I believe by doing this, you are saving our schools. We are threading a needle here to get this right. And if we ignore it and kick the can down the road, there may not be an option again to have our have schools on sites where we have them now in some capacity, any capacity. And that window closes very soon. And my intention is to save our schools. Even if there's a cost and a compromise to do that. And I will never forget being put in position to be the swing boat on this. Ms. Escobar, I don't have the history uh, that many on this board have. and. I just want to thank each of them for the, the thought process that you have gone through to get to where you are tonight. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to sit in a meeting with Brian uh, when we learned some of this information, and um, it, it really helped me understand the significance of all of this. Um, but what has also helped me understand the significance of all this is you. And so I, I really, truly um, appreciate the time and the effort that it takes um, to be here, to uh, advocate for your kids. I get it. Um, I, I didn't know that this was a decision that I would have to be in uh, when I got this role. And please know that I take it very, very seriously. Um, you don't have to live in Concord your whole life to understand that Concord's a special place. You don't have to live in Concord or be a parent at Beverly Hills Elementary or an alum of Beverly Hills Elementary to understand that that is a special place. It is a special place. Um, I 
can't make everybody happy. I can't. Um, I, I just can't. Nobody can on this board. No one's going to be able to. Um, but that's not a reflection of, 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 of not caring, of not, not hearing you. I have heard you. I really have. Um, and um, I, I don't want to take away from the powerful words that we just heard. Um, I just, I just want to say thank you for your time. I know this isn't easy. And that goes to the board, too. Okay, board members, we have a motion on the floor. So we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of closing Beverly Hills School, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. That's a 4-3 vote. So that motion passes. Board members, we will move to 11.01. .01. call for a motion that our meeting be adjourned. I need a second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Ms. Sandage. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>